Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, and welcome. Uh, today, we're going to go to Ireland, and this case is rather confounding, and there's so much information on it. I'm going to share where I got all, where I got all my information and where you can get the information and try to figure it out for yourself. But in today's case, which is about this beautiful woman, Sophie Tuscan du Plantier, and I, I'm going to botch French uh, names and I'm going to botch Irish names. So I apologize up front. And when you're rolling your eyes and you write in the comments, that's not how you say it. <laughs> probably, probably you're correct. All right. So welcome everybody who is in the chat room. I haven't had a chance to say hello to everybody because I was racing to get this show together today because I kept watching more and more things, uh, reading more and more stuff. So I kind of got behind. But thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm not going to go through all your names because we have a big crowd today, but I'm glad you're here. And if you, too, would like to be in the chat room, I have pa patron-only chat rooms at my on my show. Uh, this is uh, my uh, Patreon. You can go to the link in the uh, description below. Click on it. If you join, it's five bucks a month. You can come to eight different lives. I have a case show every week and I have a hangout every week with news and, and analysis and opinions and you can send in your stuff. And we have a nice community that can chat with each other during the week. So I think it's a good deal. And it also supports this educational channel. But of course, you don't have to do that. You can see every one of my videos at YouTube and please do subscribe. If you're going to watch a lot of stuff, please subscribe and support the channel. That costs zero. Uh, do that. Uh, like the videos and click the bell for notifications. And for anything you're interested in, go to the search engine on YouTube and put in profiler Pat Brown and the case you're interested in that can pop up really quickly for you. I have playlists and you can go through the playlist and see all the different cases I've done. But sometimes people are lazy and they'd like, oh, did you do this case? I'm like, yes, I did. But you can always throw it in the search engine and find it. OK, uh, I also have some books below you can buy to support the channel. And there's a little dollar sign. Anyway, all right, let me get on to the case. This one, oh, what a fascinating case. Uh, and it's fascinating for a couple of reasons. One is it appears to be a crime that has no motive. All right, one of these things where it's not obvious why she was killed in such a brutal way. Um, and for all the speculating around people are doing everywhere on the internet and pointing fingers this way and that way, Pretty much all fingers are going to this guy, Ian Bailey, uh, a, a journalist from England who was living in the, the same town that she was visiting where she had bought her home uh, for her like vacation home. <laughs> it's like all the fingers pointing at this guy. And uh, he isn't happy about it. He is not convicted of the crime, mind you. It's been it's been two decades and he's still living in the town. Um, and I'll get to all of his story and her story. But. As I get started, I'm going to read you the shortest thing I can on the case in case you've never heard of it. Uh, of course, from Wikipedia, which is useful, if nothing else. Uh, Sophie Tuscan uh, de Plantier, a 39-year-old French woman, was killed outside her holiday home. I went there. In a near, you know, here's the beginning of botching Irish words go, uh, Tourmore, uh, near Tourmore, Goleen, County Cork, Ireland, on the night of 23 December 1996. So we are talking almost a 30-year-old case at this point. British journalist, that guy, Ian Bailey, who lived near her home, he was three miles from her home, um, was a suspect. Well, he is the suspect. Now, mind you, it doesn't mean he is the guy who did it. It just means they never came up with another good suspect. So he's he's... He's been the face of suspect ever since this case started. Um, and he was arrested twice by the, and I'm, now I'm going to point out what this word is. And so I can, <laughs> this, this is the word, this is a name for the police in Ireland. And as I was watching all the different shows, it, I, I heard so many different pronunciations. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I heard a garde or garde. <laughs> I heard guards. And, and I think guards comes from the fact that you stuff the S from the second word onto the first word. I'm going to use that one because that's easier for me to pronounce. Actually, there was a, there's a very funny little video on YouTube about how to pronounce that. It's a whole skit, and I still can't pronounce it. So I'm going to say guards, the police, all right? Um, 
they arrested him twice and let him go. And no charges were laid because an, uh, they cannot actually charge anybody without permission from the Director of Public Prosecutions, also known as DPP. Um, and they found there was insufficient evidence to proceed to trial. And then, so, so he never did get convicted or go to trial in Ireland. Um, Bailey lost a libel case against six newspapers in 2003 because they were laying, he, they were saying, yeah, he did it or, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he, he fought them, but a journalist himself, he made his own accusations against people and so he didn't do so well in that lawsuit. So he lost. He also lost a wrongful arrest case against the guards, uh, minister for justice and the attorney general, attorney general in 2015. So he's, he likes to, um, Sue. Um, so I just want to let you know, Ian Bailey, I am not going to say anything during this broadcast, which says you are one of two things, guilty of murdering this woman, and two, that you're a psychopath. I'm not going to say either one of those two things. Okay? So I'm just going to purport a theory in the words of another very famous British person. I'm going to purport theories. Uh, and... I'm not saying these theories are correct. I'm going to say, looking at what we know, here are some theories. And I'm going to purport two theories, which I think are kind of interesting. And neither one of them is necessarily highly supported by absolute evidence. And this is the problem in the whole case. As a profiler, I like to look at evidence specifically, physical, behavioral, circumstantial, and be able to say, this all hones in and proves this person did it. This is not so in this in this particular case. It's a, it's a little bit lean on enough evidence to, well, exactly why why they didn't prosecute him. And I can't blame them. I, um, I think the DPP was pretty harsh on the guards. I think they were a little unfair. I read the report. But on the other hand, I understand where their final conclusion came down, which was there wasn't quite enough to go to trial. And so I'm in agreement with that. And I'm, did I say he was guilty? No. I'm going to go through the other possibilities, the other theories out there, and what I think of them, and then what I think about the theory about him, uh, because he certainly has been, obviously, the prominent suspect. Um, so after he lost that case, in 2019, he was convicted of murder by in Paris, by the courts in Paris, who, who apparently saw this very differently and have a different standard of what, what proof is needed. Uh, and that's also a judge system where they have three judges as opposed to a jury. They found him guilty and they sentenced him to 25 years in prison. He was tried in absent, abs, abs, I can never pronounce that word, absentia, um, uh, because he's like, hey, I'm not going there. I can't, I can't blame him. I, if I were him, I wouldn't have rolled over to France and said, okay, I'm going to show up in court because then you're there and they don't have to extradite you. And then if they find you guilty, even if you're not, you go to prison. So he stayed home. Uh, I would do the same. Um, and uh, but so he, he was found guilty in France. Um, but Ireland refused to allow him to be extra, extradited. So he was not extradited. Um, that was in 2020. They ruled he could not be extradited. So he lives on in the same town. Uh, and he plies his wares in the local 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 town square. He sells odd items and he sells poetry and uh, I'll get into some of the things he sells and and puts out there. Let me see if I can find a little picture of him um, as as today. Where's my today picture? I really have way too many. <laughs> I have way, is this him? Yep, there he is. All right, there he is. And he's, no, he's a lot older. He's a, he was an extraordinarily handsome man. I'm going to get into the handsome man issue in a bit. Extraordinarily handsome man when he was in the 30s going on to 40. He was a good looking dude. And he's now in his, his 60s. And he looks like everybody in their 60s, which is, you look 60-ish or 70-ish, you know. So he anyway, he sells stuff in his, uh, this, uh, stands, just stands around town and he it, uh, promotes some of his, his book. He did a book and I'm going to get into his book in a little bit His West Cork Way, his poetry book. All right. So that's the setup. Okay. Now I'm, now I'm getting toasty. So, <laughs> it's the lights. All right. I'm going to say, just check on uh, the, just the chat room before I go into the details of the case. All right. Let's see. Um,
Uh, Jill says, evidence-based analysis is what differs you, Pat, from crystal ball profilers. <laughs> I do appreciate that um, a lot. Um, uh, we There is, unfortunately, uh, um, a lot of profiling that is done. I'm going to, I don't know if I clicked on those. Gee, I know Jim Clemente put something out for this case. He wasn't, I thought his was reasonable. Um, and there was a couple, another profile I didn't know. And I thought they were not unreasonable um, because they were profiling sort of the person who would do this kind of thing. But that's, that's one of those vague things. I mean, um, and I, I, I try to lean away from just doing psychological profiling, which means that you just come up with a, uh, a picture of a monster, one kind of monster, another kind of monster. And some of it is so outrageously, you know, create creative that it's not necessarily so. Um, but so I try to stick with evidence. This is an interesting case because there's is like zero physical evidence linking to anyone. And that makes makes things tough. Um, but there are things that are very interesting. And as I point out, when I do shows here, it's an educational channel. I'm not trying to solve the crime. I'm not saying trying to say somebody absolutely did it. The real profiling should be done in the investigative pro process, which is why I like to consider criminal profiling. I have a word I've coined, investigative criminal profiling, because it belongs in the investigation. So the detectives do the profiling themselves, or they have a profiler working with them to help them during the investigative process in order to point them in a direction of, what is better? What's a better avenue of investigation? Who should we look at? Why should we look at them? What should we be looking for? And then when that profiling helps forward the investigation, that's when you're supposed to get more evidence because you've been pushed the right direction or you've pushed yourself the right direction. You, detectives are profilers. They really are. Um, they do the basically the same thing. Um, baby, uh, the only problem with a lot of detectives, they don't have training. And a criminal profiler who's been around for like myself for 30 years and has studied all the stuff about profiling, has more training in that than they do if they you know, just went from the street to the detectives, detective thing without any, any education. And now they're detectives. They just lack that. But they do the same thing. They try to figure out who did it. They look at the evidence, try to figure out what the evidence means. That's the whole point. So in this case, the physical evidence was lacking. So they were going after who is a more likely culprit as far as behavioral stuff went and circumstantial stuff went because they didn't have physical stuff to link that person to the crime. To Nobody was linked to the crime. Um, let's see. Um, okay, I have to take off my glasses. I can't. <laughs> I can see better without my glasses now, which is probably not a good thing. But anyway, um, uh Kathy says, how do you feel about unsolved cases? It seems frustrating, but you always make sense. Um, I believe that unsolved cases may often remain unsolved. I'm not unrealistic. A lot of people think, oh, especially when they get on the internet, oh my God, we're going to solve this case. We're going to solve this case. No, we're not. <laughs> if it wasn't, if the information wasn't available, unless DNA suddenly can propel the case, most of the time, unsolved cases aren't solved. And a lot of times when we do see unsolved cases solved. And they go, oh, brilliant work by the detectives. No, it's just DNA. <laughs> you know, um, they still have some stuff around. Maybe they can retest in this case. But so far, all the DNA has belonged to Sophie and not to the killer. So that's a problem. All right, let's get into the case. Let me tell you a little bit about Sophie. Uh, because Sophie, when you're looking at victims, um, why does a person become a victim? Uh, do they become a victim because of behaviors they're involved in? Do they become a victim of circumstance, uh, just bad luck? What is it? She was not a, this was not a home she spent a lot of time at. She lived in France. She came here, she bought this place at, at five years prior to her uh, murder as a place that she loved, as a beautiful place. And she, this is one of the interesting things about this case. She always came here with somebody. So keep this in mind as we go through some of the issues of why she would be killed when she was there. She wasn't there very long. She rolled in and she she was planning to roll back out. It was right before Christmas. It was like she wasn't gonna be there two days. But she she was a she was a traveler. She was used to traveling. So for her to just jump on a plane and, and zip over to uh, D Dublin and then rent a car and drive over, I guess she just liked doing that. But usually she did it with somebody. She went with her husband. She went with her son. 
Uh, she went with her mm, lover when she was on a break from her husband. I'll get into that. Uh, or with a friend. She always went with somebody. And on this particular occasion, she said, hey, I want to I want to roll over to Ireland. And nobody was willing to go. They were all exhausted. And there, she asked her aunt. She asked her friends. Nobody was willing to go because they had something else to do right before Christmas. And they all feel like super guilty because they're like, if we'd been with her, this wouldn't have happened. So then the question is how interesting this is. She, this is the only time she'd ever been alone at this house and she was murdered. Did somebody know she was alone at this house? This plays into uh, who might have committed the crime because they, you know, if, if she's always with somebody, this is not a good place to pick to go murder a woman in the middle of the night. So keep that in mind. She, she went there alone this one time. Now she was, um, let me, let me tell you a wee bit about her. Um, uh, she was a French television producer and lived in Paris with her husband and son from her first marriage. Uh, and, um, let me just show you a couple of pictures. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Before I start into all that, I forgot, I was going to show you where, where I got my information from. I like to do that because I think it's important. Everybody knows where stuff comes from and where you can get stuff from. I'm going to link as many things as I can below. This is Sophie, a murder in West Cork. Uh, it's on Netflix. Uh, it's a, th a three part series on Netflix. If you have Netflix or you can go see murder at, a, at the cottage, which is done by an Irish uh, uh, documentary guy. Um, and um, it's very good. And you can get it at a couple of, uh, I'll put the names of the places you can subscribe to. <clears throat> but you can also get it at a place called Daily Motion, which is maybe a squirrely site. But anyway, you can get three out of the four <laughs> episodes there. Missing number two, which oddly enough has the Netflix number two, uh, part, of, part of Netflix, which I'm sure was illegally done. But that's where you can see it for free. And then... There is a very good um, uh, podcast. Thank you, Clarissa, for telling me about this. West Cork, a masterpiece. Um, and I actually only, because I'd already been through two of them, um, I I saw a part six, which described a lot about him, and I learned a lot about him through that. And also, I read this book, uh, The Murder of Sophie. Um, this is by Mer uh, Michael Sheridan. Sheridan is the last name of the guy who also did this one. I, I don't know if they're related. Perhaps so, but I'm not sure because this, this, the murder at the cottage kind of like, it, it tends to lean away from uh, Ian Bailey. And this, this guy seems to be leaning toward Ian Bailey and supposedly is like the families behind it. But anyway, I don't know, but these are all the places you can find information. And it's, it is fascinating to see all the different interviews and Ian Bailey is in many interviews. I mean, this guy does not, this guy loves interviews, okay? So it's not one of these cases where you never see the guy who is the number one suspect. He's like, he shows up everywhere because <laughs> he, he loves publicity. He sure does. Anyway, let's go to Sophie. All right, this is Sophie and her little boy. She was, with, she, I think she was married. Anyway, to this, um, just the first marriage, yes. She was married uh, to somebody and had this little boy with him. And then, uh, she married again uh, to this this fellow over there, uh, you see on the right, um, and he is a huge like uh, uh, he's like a big huge producer, uh, famous guy in, in France for produ uh, producers and of movies and stuff. So they were at this point she was living in a world where they went to parties, they traveled a lot, um, went to show openings and all that. She wasn't too into that. She was kind of like. She did it, but she wasn't that thrilled with it. She kind of loved this. She kind of liked the beauty of this quiet, wonderful place. So at the time, she was married to that, uh, her husband. And she had had this, uh, they had had a breakup during their marriage where um, she spent a year with somebody else. And this plays, he, he, when he does his journalistic articles, he, he really points the finger at the, the, her present husband uh, at the time, uh, saying, well, he hired a hitman to kill her because he, you know, she was going to leave him. But apparently she wasn't going to leave him. Their things were going well in their marriage and they were looking for maybe to have another child. So he should be sued. You know, come on in. You can't complain about other journalists when you do the same thing. <laughs> you know? So anyway, his claim was that a hitman 
the husband hired a hitman to go after her into this this completely because well I'll, I'll give him one credit on that the one person who would know she was going alone would be the husband actually anybody in the family would have known she was going alone but the fact is she was wasn't planning to go alone to the last minute because nobody was uh, the people kept turning her down she's like oh crap okay i'll go so to find a hitman in ireland at the last minute who then wouldn't be able to find the house go there in the middle of the night have her open up the door to him and then commit a crime which is without it, the guy didn't bring a weapon the crime was committed with with what was available at the scene doesn't seem like a hit <laughs> and supposedly they were they were they were on a good point in their marriage uh she had had a year off whatever reasons i mean and she did and she brought her the guy at the time she brought him to this place and he also said that she was like she was like a you a hoe you know that's what you get saying you a hoe you just got all these men you you just have your slut you got all these men coming up there it wasn't true you know like her son came with her and her boyfriend at the time came with her but there was no indications that she was promiscuous in the sense that she was like picking up dudes from the village and and partying with her. You know, none of that was true. She's very quite quite a quiet woman, um, and she had the person who was with her, um, and so they had a break, and she was with somebody else. But that failed, and then she reunited with her her husband, and apparently he was happy about that. Um, she was his third wife. He kind of had trophy wives and now after her death about a year and a half later he married another pretty woman you know guys don't like to be alone you know that's that's just guys all right so that's basically her her the basic stuff about her that you need to know now so she bought this pretty house and one of the interesting things about this shows that the village is this it's it's a place called here i go let me go i'm gonna try it's school school <laughs> And it is a, a smaller village uh, in Ireland. Um, and it's, you know, the whole, the whole, the scenery around it is, is quite, quite spectacular and beautiful and uh, kind of eerie. And, you know, but if you, you know, if you go up there to that real red line that didn't show up on my picture, you're, there's Dublin. And then if you drive into driving down to the end of this coast here, that's where school is and Turmore uh, is a little further on. So that's where she lived and that's where she wanted to be because it was just a spectacularly beautiful area. So she bought this house. There's the house. Uh, you will notice a house behind her and this plays into some people's theories. Um, a guy, the, the guy living there is his name, last name is Lion. He lived there with his uh, partner. He was in his 60s. He was a frail character. Um, he, just, he did plant weed on his property and there was some thought that he sold some of it. Um, uh, and so he lived there with another six, a six year old woman. And so there were a couple people living on that property. There was supposedly some issues with Sophie and some of the land issues. So the claim is that a, he killed her because she had land issues with her and B he killed her because she ratted him out for, for the weed industry he had, which is not very many plants. So anyway, that that's kind of some of the claims. Um, but the police, I just want to point this out, the guards, um, they, right after she was murdered, they went to that, They first of all, the, the wife, um, uh, the woman, let me let me tell you, what, let me just read you here, The uh, as far as what happened. She was found dead by a neighbor at 10 p.m., I'm sorry, 10 a.m., and that was the neighbor, uh, the closest neighbor. There were only three houses on that street. One was unoccupied by another person who was what they called um, a blow-in. In other words, somebody who kind of comes in from another location isn't really the locals. Um, and they were from another location too. And they were like vacationers. So that there are three houses. One of them wasn't occupied at the time. And then there was Sophie's house. And then there was the lion and lion's house. Um, and his partner in the morning driving out found her lying at the bottom of the drive. So the drive goes up and in there you have the house here and the, her house and then the house there. Uh, and her her body was lying where you see the cover there. Um, so she found found uh, was found dead by a neighbor at 10 a.m. Her body clad in nightwear and boots. And the nightwear and boots is very interesting to me. In a laneway beside her house, her long john bottoms. And long johns is also interesting. Um, long johns keeps you warm in a cold house. And this is one of these houses that gets quite chilly at night, especially at this time of the year. 
And again, what was time of the year was that? December. <laughs> December in Ireland by the sea. <clears throat> it's chilly. She's wearing long johns. Long johns is not what I wear for a date. Just want to point that out, guys. <laughs> you know, guys coming over. I'm dressing up. Put my long johns on. <laughs> Come on now. No, that is not a that is not date clothing. Okay. <laughs> she got she's dressed for night nightwear. She's got nightwear on. She's got long guns to keep herself warm. So nobody was visiting her. And I think it's extremely important. When the police went in her house, they found it pristine, like she'd been there by herself. There is zero evidence anybody ever actually entered her home. Unlike what Ian would tell you, which is like she's slutting around, you know, and she had a dude up there, they were drinking wine, and something went wrong. There's no evidence anybody else was in the house. Zero forensic evidence, zero behavioral evidence, nothing. And she's dressed for bed. Now, she talks to her husband for like an hour, like, I forgot what time it was, uh, see exactly what time it was. Um, I'm on the wrong part of a uh, there's so much information on this case. I just want to apologize ahead of time. There's so much. And since I do these cases pretty much <laughs> on the fly, uh, because I don't do editing. If I did editing, I would have a, I'd have a whole outline. I have everything done. I talk about different things and I glue them all together. It's not happening here. I'm trying to tell you the basics to understand the case. So she was on the phone with her husband at some point in time, which was quite late, like near midnight. And for an hour, they chit-chatted. Um, and she was in bed. She was reading a book. So she wasn't entertaining is what I want to point out. She was not entertaining. S after that happened, at some point, someone appeared at the house at her back door. And that's, um, that's basically it. So she was not, she did not bring somebody home. She was not entertaining. Get that out of your head. That didn't, that never have ever happened. So, but the next morning, her neighbor, she finds her body right there. So she, she is effectively runs back to the house supposedly and tells her husband, call, 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 whatever the 911 is there, uh, call them and tell them there's a, she didn't know it was her because her face was bashed in so badly. It was a body with a bashed in face. She was like freaked and just ran. Husband calls, please show up. OK, um, uh, the police, I want to tell you about just to say this about the neighbors um, that have been sometimes pointed out as a possible the, the, the male, mostly the male that they're saying he had some issues because of his weed growing and all that crap that he that he was the that he had some issue with her because some some profilers and some Internet profilers will say because she was so brutally killed let me let me see if i can read you about how she was actually killed um oh come on now they're gonna fail me on wikipedia uh let's put it this way her face was smashed in a whole lot boom 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 with like a rock uh the, the theory is that maybe back at the door of the house uh let me let me show you just the a little bit about the um um Hold on a second. Uh, where is it? Okay, here we go. Um, at the door, there is this blood thing. And it, it can only appear two ways. One is, it, it, this is where it's a little confounding. Because remember, this woman's in bed, reading a book, talk to her husband. She's cozying up. There is a reason she opened the door. Keep this in mind. She's got to open the door for a reason. Obviously, somebody, bang, bang, bang. What would get you up from your coziness? Mom, look at where she's living. It's quite isolated. There's only one neighbor. The other house is unoccupied. And then everybody else is far, far away. It's like 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, whatever. I don't know exactly the time. The police don't either. They don't have a time of death. They don't know exactly what time this occurred. So she's in bed. She's either reading her book or she's asleep. One of the two things. Somebody bangs on this door. Now, it's not the front door. The front door has a light coming down, would show you who it is. You could see. Apparently, that's not the front door. This is like a, a another backside door. 
she has there's actually a key she hasn't she puts in the door to open it so it's, it's a locked door it's not unlocked she locked at night so it wasn't one of these places where nobody locks their doors but she locked and she obviously unlocked and opened the door to her killer dressed in night clothes and and um long johns and she had boots on it took, I studied, I worked so hard to find out about the boots. Because I'm like, why does she have boots on? Because <laughs> if you're in the house and planning to stay in the house, why do you have boots on? Okay. Apparently one boot was laced up. She liked boots. If you look at a lot of pictures of her, she's out and about. She was only wearing boots. But these aren't boots you just shove your feet into. These are boots. One, they had, one is, was laced up and one was only partially laced up. Well, to me, that means that she didn't have the boots on. She wasn't just wandering around the house with boots on. She must have gotten up and gone down and at the bottom of the stairs, apparently she's in a, she's in a bedroom. She goes down the stairs. That's where she left her boots because it's a cold house. And I, I've lived in, I used to own a 250 old house and I had uh, pine boards for floors. Let me tell you, <laughs> it was chilly in the winter. All right, it was a two, it was a farmhouse. It was built in seventeen hundreds. It was chilly in the winter, um, and when you got out of bed, those floorboards were really cold. Um, now I live in a house with carpeting. Okay, if I go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, believe me, I don't waste my time putting on boots. If I were going down to answer the door, I would I would just I just be bare feet, but. If I were in a freezing cold house like my old house, would I put on something to go down the stairs and over to the door? And I would say possibly. Um, and now I would probably put on socks and not boots. Um, maybe some, some slippers. I don't know why, but she apparently liked boots a lot. So she seems to have come down the stairs, pulled on a boot, started lacing it up. Maybe she heard the knocking was getting stronger. She started to lace up the other hand. And, and she's like, what the heck? She answered the door. At whatever time of night it was. She wasn't, a, wasn't her lover coming. Why would she open the door at that time of night? And did she know who was behind the door? I'm just going to stop here just to see what your comments are on that. Because I find that very fascinating. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go to the bottom of all the 5,000 comments. Um, uh, Loretta says, this French woman has a genuine looking smile. What a shame. Apparently, everybody liked her very, very much. Um, you know, it, it's quite something to have the personality that people find endearing. And she did have that kind of personality. They said she was a little, little um, secretive sometimes and a little unique but but then they said every time she was with them she was kind and she was one of these people she she stopped by just to have a chat she stopped she she was very very much um liked by the population never and there was not nobody said a bad word about her so you know um yeah she was that kind of person the kind of person that everybody thought was quite sweet and wonderful yeah and and they did like her. Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, she's beautiful. In interesting that you say that, Sarah, because Ian Bailey, the journalist, said she was quite plain looking. And I suppose it all depends on the day you're looking at somebody, um, and what your opinion is, or whether you're trying to down the person. <laughs> um, what. There, there's times when she does look plainer and there's times when she looks more glamorous. So I suppose it all depends. Um, but Ian Bailey oddly said, oh, she's plain looking. And does he say that because he's going to say, that's why I have no interest in her. That's why she doesn't attract me. That's why I would never have committed this crime. Hmm. Perhaps. Um, I'm going to get to the coat evidence in a wee bit. Uh, this, is, this is an interesting point. Loretta says, French are not so puritanical as Anglo culture people. So we need to see their affairs a bit differently. Uh, this is one of the, this is a unique issue between different cultures as to what is more acceptable in one place and not so acceptable in another. And I agree that having watched a number of French movies in my lifetime and not very happily because I don't like French movies um, <laughs> because everybody's except the, they're either eating or having sex. No, and usually with somebody that's not their partner. But but apparently a more um, a freer society, shall we say? So that is correct. 
Um, that is correct. Um, looks like a place I love. It's very beautiful. That house was really, I love the house. Absolutely love the house. Okay, let me go down to see what you say about the, uh, why she answered the door. Okay. Lisa says, she was found at the gate a ways down from the house. So that may explain the boots. Was she lured innocently? Hey, Sophie. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's one or two o'clock in the morning. Nobody's going to, no, <laughs> the baker's not showing up. For, I, the question has been often whether she was lured all the way from here, one o'clock in the morning, all the way down here. Mind you, she didn't have a coat on. No coat. I would think if she heard, I thought about this. Let's say somebody came up to the gate. Now the gate, by the way, it was also interesting. The gate here is one of these that closes. And I wanted to know this information. I spent a lot of time looking for boot information, a lot of time looking for gate information. The gate closed and was then you had to secure the gate. Why? Because people had animals behind that gate and they didn't want them getting out. All right. So when she drove up, she stopped like everybody did who lived on the other side of the gate stopped. You have to get out of the car. You have to open up the gate. You drive in, you go back, you close the gate. Okay. That's the way it worked. So at night, this gate was closed, but you see here, the gate is not closed. So I think from what I'm seeing and I, I can't, you know, this is one of the problems when you're not an investigator on the case. You can't go there personally. So, you know, it's one of these things where if I had the chance, I actually know people in Ireland right now. I would love to go to this actual location and see how, what, what it actually looks like. So if you were, if you were driving up here, obviously you would have to stop and open the gate, but nobody heard the sound of a car. All right. And she, and the car never went up to her house. So, they had no the car would have no reason a person with a car would have no reason to open the gate. So why was the gate open? My, what I would assume, and I have to say, assume usually means an asset, making an ass out of you and me, because I learned that from the odd couple many years ago. Um, the guy couldn't enter without opening the gate to walk up to the location. So, and it was hard to get over the fence. There's a lot of briars here, which she was all tangled up in and, and ripped up her poor little body. A lot of briars. So if the guy can't jump over the fence, he's got to open the gate. And why would he jump over the fence if he can open up the gate? So he opens up the gate and he goes up the driveway. Whether he drove there and parked his car, whether he walked there, we do not know. Whether he drove halfway and walked there, we do not know. This is all the stuff we don't know. But somebody walked up here I went to her house. She did not put her coat on. So no, I don't believe she was coming down to the gate. Like somebody went beep, beep, beep. She said, what the heck? So she put on a coat because she knew she was going to be as free. It was quite chilly. She was going to walk all the way down that thing. I think she would put a coat on, not just her boots, but a coat. Why did she put her boots on? Maybe because the house is cold and she's walking down and she's just there at the bottom of the step. She gets down there. She just puts her boots on quick, but she's going to go answer the door and she, her feet are freezing. That is the best I can come up with. But I can't say absolutely. So, yeah, it, it's it's really, really quite hard to say. Um, but she would have, if she heard a car, why would she go down one o'clock in the morning? Put on, she again, she would put a coat on. I'm, I'm bothered by the lack of a coat. Um, uh, yes. Oh, no, you can drive through, but you got to open up the whole gate. You can't get through without the gate being open. Um, Bluebell says, I love the way you deconstruct it deconstruct a scenario pat it's easy to overthink a situation i wouldn't have given much thought to her boots yeah um there's these things that stand out to me in certain crimes that that become my red flags and then i go why why does a person do this now mind you i can i can be wrong because sometimes you don't think about things a way the way that another person would think so you gotta be real careful of that um uh like i know people have said to me over and over again I, I asked them this question, Pat Brown, profiler Pat Brown. I lived in a 250 year old house, slightly off the road, not as off the road as this. <laughs> Mind you, it was in a neighborhood, but I was back off the road. I heard a knock one night, my front door. It's like freaking midnight, you know, I'm like, what the heck? I asked people, do you think I went down there and opened that door? And people, go, oh, no, 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 Pat Brown wouldn't do that. She's not an idiot. Okay, Pat Brown is an idiot. Pat Brown is a curious person. And 
something about, I want to know what's on the other side of the door. <laughs> just, I wanted to know. Now there were people in the house. We had a lot of people in the house, a lot of cars on the driveway, which made it a safer place because if you're going to pick a place to like a uh, home invasion, we had like uh, two cars for our family. Actually had three, my car, my husband's car, and the work vehicle. We had three. We also had two, at least two renters. So there were at least two more cars on the driveway. At least five cars on the driveway. No idiot is going to like, oh, let's home invade. Let's go back up the street where the place has five cars. No. So I think I had a level of safety in my head saying, this is likely not a home invasion. As I got to the door, I looked out and I saw a big dude. <clears throat> I didn't know who he was. I opened the door. I said, hi, what do you want? And he goes, Jeremy home, which is my son's name. I went, yeah. And so he came in and was, went to see my son. Never met him, never saw him. He's a big dude, just a guy. But I did open the door. So you have to be careful when you say, why do people do what they do? Now, if I had been alone there, would I have done that? Different case. But there were five cars in the driveway. There were three males in the house and me and three children. Do I really think it was a home invasion? No. So you have to look through all the different details to try to figure it out. All I can come up with here is she put her boots on because of, and she had a habit of taking her boots off only when she went up the stairs into her bed. So perhaps that was her whole thing was that if she's going to walk around downstairs, it was just too freaking cold. She put her boots on at least, at least most of the way, but she didn't put a coat on because she wasn't planning to go out of the house. And I think this is very important. She wasn't planning to leave the house, but she did open the door to somebody. And why would she do that is the question. This plays into a lot of that. Um, so let's see what you say about that. Um, no, there wasn't a bed, bread, a bread trail, a blood trail, just some blood on the door. And then no, nothing till the end of the drive. Um, uh, that is blood on the big, yeah. So, so essentially something happened here. Now, some people think the guy came back and touched this 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 thing and, and looked, went into the house. I don't buy that story because I'm pretty sure, first of all, there's nothing disturbed in the house. Nothing. It looks pristine. So unless you're going to go there and, and like make it look like a burglary gone wrong, you wouldn't be op going back to the house and reopening the door. If they, uh, that's, that's, there's no reason to do that. Most likely this happened. He, she was something happened here to cause her to run down the drive. She was running. She didn't, she couldn't get back in the house. Believe me, if somebody's tacking you on the doorstep, wouldn't you just close the door? If you could, she didn't close the door. She, cause somebody blocked that door. So she had no option, but to run down this, this, this drive. Now, some people say, why didn't she, why didn't she, they ask, um, run up to her neighbor's house. And this is, this is part of the theory about her neighbor was the one who, you know, she was scared of and the one who was standing out there. Therefore she couldn't run to his house. Uh, let me see. Hold on a second. Um, hold on. Hold on. I'm trying to, uh, okay. Let me, let me show. So look, let's look at her house again up there on the hill. Uh, i got to find the, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Okay. Here we go. All right. Lion's house is up there. The claim is why didn't she run up the hill? toward help because there's only other human beings around we're in the lion's house why did she run down the hill well first of all we all know that running up a hill is not easy <laughs> okay that takes a lot more energy and if you're running away from somebody who is trying to kill you running up is means he's probably going to catch you that's a pretty damn long way up there so also if this guy blocks the door and then he blocks your way up. There's only one way to go, which is down. So she's running, hope, hoping to run away from him, you know, because you're in a panic. People don't understand panics. And a lot of people say also that no one heard her scream. Uh, the lions didn't hear, the lion and his wife, uh, partner didn't hear her, her scream. Alfie Lion, I think is his name. Uh, they said they didn't hear anything. They were in bed and they were asleep. And somebody somewhere passing by in a distance said they thought they heard a howl. They thought it was an animal. Just because you're being killed doesn't mean you're screaming. Just want to point that out. A lot of people don't scream. They freeze. Their voice gets stuck in their throat. So it's not always that to be shrieking, shrieking. 
Well, you would think she'd shriek running down the driveway, but you're in a panic state. And it's dark. It's cold. There's a killer after you. You don't, your mind, all you're doing is running in a blind panic. I think blind panic is a proper word. Blind panic, meaning your brain is not functioning really well. You don't think really well. You you do things where you run into stuff. Uh, you, know, you run into a wall. You trip and fall. You just, you're so freaked out that you're just trying to get away from the, the thing that's coming after you, the monster that's coming after you. It's hard to know if she screamed, whether she ran fast, whether she, we don't know what she did. All we know is she, poor Sophie is just trying to get away from the guy. That's all. Trying to get away. Uh, so I'm pretty sure he blocked her. So the question is, why did she open the door to him? And there seems to be only two realistic answers to that. One is, and he came around to the dark side of the house. In other words, where she wouldn't see who he was. One answer is that she knew the person and therefore was willing to open the door, but then something went wrong on the doorstep and she wouldn't let him in and he lost his brains. Two, she didn't know the person, but she couldn't see him and thought because the person was beating on their door, she thought, that maybe her neighbors were in trouble. Maybe something, maybe, maybe, maybe there was a, they had a heart attack up there. There's something terrible and she, they needed her to call the whatever. Maybe their phone didn't work. Sometimes when you hear people banging in the middle of the night, you think something, something terrible has happened. So you don't want to be a bad person to say, I'm not going to answer the door. You're like, oh my God, it could be the neighbor. Something's wrong. Maybe it's, maybe it's Alfie. Maybe his wife's just laying on the floor or something and he's freaking out and didn't know what to do. So he came to me. So she opens the door. She doesn't have to know who's on the other side. Or she could have known who's on the other side and thought, what the heck? And opened the door out of curiosity because she's like, why? She knows who this person is, but why are you here? Those two things. All right. I'm going to leave that there. All right. Let's go to Ian Bradley. I'm sorry. Ian Bailey. I always want to call me Ian Bradley. I wonder why. Anyway, yeah, let's go to Ian Bailey. Okay. I want to talk about him because he's the number one suspect. Sorry, Ian, you are, and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, let me show you a little bit about him. All right. Who was Ian Bailey? Now, the, the, I'm going to give you the short version, and I'm going to read you some stuff that I think I, I think I got it from. I got it from either the book or the video, but fascinating. And I think this tells us about his character. And I think his character is important in this case because there's no physical proof linking him to the crime. Now, let me read you why he got linked to the crime to begin with. Ian Kenneth Bailey was born in Manchester, England. He worked variously as a freelance journalist, sometimes published under the name of E-I-O-N Bailey when he got to Ireland, and was a fish farm worker and held a market stall selling pizzas and poems. He moved to Ireland in 1991 and lived with his partner in Golin from 1992 onwards. Okay, let's just stop there and look at his past life, just so you can understand who this guy is. Now, yeah, so so essentially, let me let me try, let me read you some of this stuff. So, his father was a butcher, mom was at home. They didn't have a lot of money, but a lot of food because dad was a butcher, so he got great steaks. Ian was a bit different. Let's stop with different. What does different mean? Now, I, I was always considered a bit different in my family, which is why I always looked to see if I was adopted because I didn't seem to fit, fit into the family. So I was different. I was not adopted, but regardless, it doesn't matter if you're blood relative or you're not you know, adopted. It doesn't make any difference. You can be different no matter what. But you can be different in a good way or different in a family's having issues with you. way. <laughs> Okay, maybe when I was younger, they were looking at me the same way. <laughs> so he was different. He didn't really, they had issues with him, let's put it that way. He did well at school academically, but got into drinking. So he's, he is a lifelong alcoholic, just to let you know. There's no question about that. This dude's an alcoholic, all right? His parents never understood him. And I don't mean that in, oh, you know, some of his parents don't understand kids. No, they couldn't figure out what's wrong with their kid. He rebelled. His sister was the good one. Now, interestingly, there shows two of them. And one of the things we see sometimes in families, and I've seen this with families where I've uh, looked at them for whether the son was a serial killer. And one case I have 
I was checking to see whether the son, who was clearly, in my opinion, a psychopath, could also be a serial killer. And it was fascinating because when I talked to his dad, he said he was the one we could never understand. And the sister was like the perfect girl. She became, and she became a social worker. And she said, I never understood my brother, but she was the good one. He was the one something was not quite right with. Same thing here. So the sister was the good one. Parents were glad when he left home. That's interesting. And if one of the things also interesting, all of these stories, all of the videos, the movies, I don't see one thing that the family is rushing in to, to say, this guy's innocent. I don't even know where they are. I think they're hiding. I, I and That's usually an indication that there's just, they also have issues and questions. Hmm. All right. So anyway, he started hooking up. He, um, he never understood him, so he left home. A journalist group thought of him, he had a bright future because he was handsome, smart, six foot four, deep voice. The guy's good looking. Okay, I personally think attractive man, all right? Capable and persuasive. Did well in his first year, was a good salesman, and he got this lucky story. So, and when he started into journalism, he had capabilities and, and he was a persuasive salesperson, which I think is important to understand that when a person can sell themselves, people overlook what you're not doing, okay? Then he marries a woman named Mary Sarah Limburg the next year. Her parents give them a five-year-old home. So he married into money, he got a house. I mean, he's a young man. He got a house, right, with his new wife. He changed his accent, wanted to impress people, show off, and had a big ego. So he, was, he wanted to move up in society, apparently. His father was a butcher, mind you. He was at this level and now he's gotten to this level and, and he's married a woman with money who has a, they have a house now. He changes. He is now playing a different role. And I'm going to, this will play into my theory two on him. I have theory one and theory two play into my theory two. And you, you might be, it's, it's an interesting theory. So you hang in until you hear it because you, I'm going to, I'm going to be curious what you think. All right. Then his marriage went south. He was heartbroken and angry. Why is she doing this to me? His name went. On, his name wasn't on the house deed, so he didn't get the house. So the, basically, end up with nothing, right? Hold on a second. Oh, sorry, I froze there. Do you, does everybody see me? <laughs> I froze for a minute. I just want to check that my internet has not decided to be unfortunate with me because I fixed my internet. I just want to make sure I'm still here um, while I go on to the next part. Tell me if you can see and hear me still, even though I froze for a second. All right. So anyway, he uh, he wasn't happy because he lost his wife. He said it was her fault. Uh, he said, when my eyes are open, they can see me. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Uh, he lost his wife. He said it was her fault. Mind you, he one of the things he sued papers about was the, the claim that he had assaulted his first wife and strangled her. So keep this in mind. And he failed completely with her. Um, he, 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 uh, he showed signs of cracking up. He was throwing things and punching walls. All right. Uh, so he was also doing less work and he was skimming money from his partner. So he's a crook. He was a crook ripping off his partner. And, and now he's that, that whole era part of his life is gone. So he's moved to England. But before I go on, I got, I got to tell you this side story. So the ex-wife, you got to wonder who she picks for, for, for boy, for, for husbands. Cause apparently she had a child with the next guy she was with. You're not going to believe this story. This is the guy. Okay, this is her her son. This is not Ian's son. Just want to let you know it's not Ian's son, so don't go there. Um, and let me tell you the story. That I read this first on Reddit, and I thought it was a I thought it was a Reddit thing. You know, people making up crap on the internet. So I have make sure you check things out. I checked it out. Ian Bailey married Lara, Sarah Limbrick, a fellow journalist, and oh, is it Gloucester? Or Gloucester. <sighs> I forgot to check that one. In 1980, when Bailey was 23, but they reportedly split up approximately five years later. That would be somewhere around 1985. Sarah Limbrick had a son named Jamie, born somewhere around 1986. Okay, so they're claiming it could be his kid. Uh, does that look like his kid? Let me look at that. That's an ugly child. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. He's a good looking man. I don't know what the wife looked like. <laughs> anyway, that's a, that boy did not win in the gene department. Anyway, 
could it be his? I don't know. They just, they didn't say it was his. They, they, he was, she was supposed to be somebody else, but listen to this. So anyway, he, he, uh, so now this guy, oh, sorry, where's the son? He was 17 years old in 2003 when he raped, and this, I should not smile because it's horrible, raped and murdered his 93 year old, sometimes 91 year old, great grandmother, Marjorie Davis. He raped and murdered his grandmother. Her body was found in her farmhouse, which had been badly damaged by fire because after he raped and murdered, he set the place on fire. He'd been staying in an outbuilding on the property at the time of the killing. His grandparents, who owned the property, were on holiday in Spain. So he, it was supposedly not his kid, and she, it was not her husband's, how this, it wasn't his ex wife's parents, it was her husband's parents' mom. Okay, something like that. So get this one. Jamie came home in the middle of the night. Let me show you his picture again. Let's look at him. Jamie came home in the middle of the night and watched a porn film. This, the sexually aroused teenager failed in his attempts to, <laughs> to find a sheep <laughs> to satisfy himself before waking his elderly relative. He raped her and strangled her to death, set fire to the home, and allegedly withdrew $250,000 from her, 250 pounds from her account. Her charge remains were found the next morning and examination of her body linked the attack to her great grandson. Apparently, Jamie Limbrick suffered from a severe personality disorder, psychopathy. He was detained and assessed at the high security hospital, Broadmoor, good old Broadmoor, where he still seemed resides. Now, so, so apparently uh, he picks women who don't pick men, the greatest guys, <laughs> let me put it that way, things go wrong. But now he's at Broadmoor. Now get this one. This, this is just, this is just, a, just something else. So anyway, Broadmoor, these, uh, these students, these killers, these three killers, uh, they, they have bought expensive equipment, are being taught how to mix music at Broadmoor Secure Hospital. So apparently they are being taught, this character and two other guys are being taught to be DJs. So when they get out of Broadmoor, which they should never ever, I mean, this guy should never leave Broadmoor. This guy should be in prison for the rest of his life because he's a sick psychopath, but, and he's not going to be cured, but they're teaching him to be a DJ. So when he gets out, he doesn't have to look for sheep or grandmothers anymore. He can get, you know, those, those girls that go to bars and hook up with DJs because I think DJs are so cool. <laughs> that's, that's just an aside, but oh my God, is that bizarre? Mm -mm -mm. All right. <laughs> oh Lord. Oh goodness gracious. The, so, but the reason I point this out is because his first wife, it is claimed and he is sued for it that he also abused his first wife. But then he meets, he comes to, he, he fails. This is the whole point. He's a failure. Um, he moves to London. He works in the newsroom, does freelance, but no full-time work. He felt a failure and that society had failed him. Uh, he hated himself and society, no doubt. Delu disillusioned as to how p newspapers are going. And I can't blame him on that one. Um, he came to Ireland seeking a different way of living. He started writing poetry. Said he'd always been an outsider, wandered around Ireland until he got to school, worked at a fishing plant, and read poems and pubs. Okay. I want to point out something very important about this. He's a failure in everything he does. He fails in his relationships with women. Uh, well, with Jules, the next woman he's going to be hooking up with, is with her for 30 years, only because she's adult. I usually call guys dolts who hook up with women who abuse them. But now I'm going to say she's a dolt because he abused her and she stayed with him for 30 years. Um, but he found a woman, uh, his first wife, who would give him a house and money so he could wander around doing part timey crap because he wasn't a successful journalist. Um, I don't know how good his journalism was, but I'm going to say it sucked. He worked as a stringer, basically. And that's just somebody who doesn't have a full time job, just run, does stuff when when stuff pops up in, in certain places. And now he's gone to Ireland to write, to write poetry, of course, which is we all know po being a poet is a great way to earn a living. <laughs> so so he takes these jobs gardening for people and working at the fish places. 
And even there, they say he's not very good at what he does. But I, I want to point out something. He was very upset about the fact that somebody had the indecency to say he wasn't a good poet. And then he tried later to toss it off and say, well, you know, I can, if they want to say that's fine, but I'm not a murderer. I read his poetry. I got it from Amazon. Uh, this is a collection. It's called West, The West Cork Way, a collection of poems and ballads by Ian Bailey. I returned that book. It was only five bucks. It's the only book he's ever written. It's the only poetry he's ever put out there, um, as far as I know. So somebody who is like a, going to be a great poet, a great author, you think would have more success in his entire freaking life than putting out this pitiful, yes, and I'll say it, pitiful book of poetry. Um, I was not impressed by any of the poems. I, I found them dull. Um, the, the stuff in between to explain certain things also was no John Steinbeck look up life and, you know, and the population news. It's just dreadful. So, you know, I don't think anybody could remember a poem, Ian, that you've ever done. And I'm going to give you a poem right now. Here's one I wrote. It's called The Perfect Babe. My wife, she brought the baby home and proudly showed him off. She said that he was perfect. I couldn't help but cough. She pointed to his, she glared at me with anger and pointed to his toes. She said, look, he's got all 10. I said, yes, but where's his nose? Now I got canceled for that poem. <laughs> but you might remember it. You'll remember it more than you'll remember his poetry. And I'm no poet. <laughs> so, Ian, you're not good at what you do. And, and it's interesting because, it, you know, when, you, when he does so many interviews, he's got a wonderful voice. And it was very handsome in the day. Um, and he just doesn't put the effort into becoming somebody. Apparently, it, it said that he wouldn't follow anybody's advice. He, was, he didn't want to work. He wanted to be seen. He wanted attention, but he didn't want to do the job to be seen. I mean, to be successful, he just he thinks everybody should just pay attention to him. He's got grandiosity in his little brain. That's a psych psychopathic trait. Not that you're a psychopath, Ian, but you don't. Here's some other interesting things people said about him. Okay, let me talk about Jules. So a few months later, he meets Jules. Now, Jules is the woman he ends up living with for 30 freaking years because Jules is adult. And yes, Jules, you can, you, I will say you're adult. And, 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 and uh, it's just sad. Um, uh, let's see if I can find, wait, where's my pictures of Jules? Um, hold on a second. Why can't I find my Jules pictures? Huh. I have them. Where are they? Hold on a second. I got to find them. Okay. Where are they? Where are they? Shoot. I've lost my Jules pictures. Um, hmm. Well, I've got this one. Oh, no. No, that's not her. Hold on a second. Jules. Where the heck did she go? Huh. Okay. I forgot to pull that one over. All right. Jules. I'm going to show you this picture. Well, there's a picture of Jules. This is um, she, um, oh, here's a, let's see if I can find a better picture of her. Yeah, here's a picture of her. Not looking too good, is she? Now, <laughs> apparently, he beat, he beat her up just like supposedly they claimed it did his first wife. Within a few months, he met Jules. He was, he was a younger man to her with children. She had children. Uh, and she had a 10-year-old at the time that was in the house, apparently. I don't know why she'd bring this guy in. She, um, he started as a renter in a studio. She had a regular house and a studio down the road. But then he moved in with her because she's got a house and you don't. Just like the first wife, got a house, you don't. And this way you don't have to earn your, your keep. You can just sleep with the lady of the house, right? He seemed to love the island and fit in. Fit, fit, he felt he fit in. But the people around him said it wasn't true. He was his own worst enemy, such as an, such as an extrovert, but he didn't do things to make him people love him. He was brash in his manner, manner pompous and overbearing. Thought he was new better. He wanted attention on him. Desperately ambitious, but no property of proper ability to get ahead. Kept trying one thing after the another to fit in. Changing his persona all the time to be different and noticed. Grandiose in his behavior. Even stood out among eccentric people. This whole area had a lot of eccentric people in it. They were musicians and writers and stuff. And his, and, and Jules was a, was a, she did art. So anyway, he essentially, uh, he beat her up. Can you see? She ripped, he ripped hair out of her head. He, um, oh, wait a minute. I'm in a weird place now. Okay. <laughs> Fixing my screen. Now. And he, 
he smashed her eye and she had to get surgery. All right. Nice fellow. All right. This was apparently he had attacked her three times. It's not the first only time he ever attacked her. He attacked her three times. All right. Now, they didn't they didn't end up arresting him. They well, they arrested him and they didn't charge him. So they let him get away with this. Three times he beat her up and one time enough to people heard her. They came to, to her house and they heard this howling and they found her with her face, her mouth ripped up and her sma eye smashed in and she had to get surgery. And she said, and this is why I call her adult. She said that she's tried to block that out of her mind. She stayed with him because uh, he only did that when he drank. So, and he doesn't stop drinking. So he's going to, she, so he's going to do it possibly again. And, but, but she blocked it out of her mind and didn't dwell on it. So she went on with this guy. And this is a sign of an abused woman. This is a sign of a desperate abused woman who stays with a guy. She's paying all the bills, mind you. He's not paying anything. I don't know what he's offering her, whether it's companionship, she's lonely, she's desperate, whatever it is. He's, she's okay with him beating her to a pulp and, and, and she'll still keep him. And this is a lifelong thing. Obviously, he's got he's had problems of violence all his life, especially when he's drinking. So this plays into why he's a good suspect in this crime, which is why the police, the guards said, hey, you know, we think you did this. Um, and why many people she pointed out, she said 50 percent of the people in town think we're guilty. 50 percent of the people think we're not. I find it interesting. She uses the word we because she should just say he. But the we part comes in. Is she lying for him? to cover up for him? Is she willing to go block out what he might have done in order for her to keep living with him? And by the way, he said this, but I mean, it does take two, you know, it takes two to tangle. Whew. Is that the sign of an abuser? You betcha. Is that sign of possible psychopathy? You bet. Where he does not, ex he says, okay, yeah, I did it. And it was a bad thing, but you know, hey, Let's blame her too. I wouldn't have done it if she hadn't, whatever. That's called, that's where you blame the victim. That's where you say, she pissed me off. She did something to make me think that made me punch her out, smash her face in, smash her face in as Sophie's face was smashed in, which is why he's hard to look away from as a suspect. Mind you, no one's been able to place him at the scene and his DNA is not there. So just because as he points out, I may have bashed up a woman I live with, I may be a violent person at times when I'm drinking, but I didn't necessarily commit that murder just because I beat her up. And that's true. You can be abuser and not be a killer. That's true. But that's the kind of guy he is. So I have no sympathy for him whatsoever. So everybody think, oh, you know, he's just a misunderstood guy. No, that, that piece of crap is a piece of crap. And if you want to sue me in over saying you're a piece of crap, go for it. All right. So anyway, people say this about him, which I think is interesting. He says that he's a bit, his friend said he's a bit clueless. He doesn't actually understand that he's making life difficult for somebody. He doesn't seem to realize his sister says the upset he causes. No, that's not the problem. You're all so nice that you don't realize he doesn't give a crap about you all. He doesn't care about other human beings. He does not. He is happy doing what he does. And it's only about him. He's that narcissistic that he doesn't care about others. He used her. She had a house for him. She paid the bills. That's why he's there. And she probably had sex with him. He got sex, a house, and, and, and a place to live. And she probably cooked for him too. And he even got his own studio because they had that extra little place where he had his own studio. He could sit there and do whatever he wanted. That's not a nice guy. Not a nice guy at all. Um, it says here, let's see what else to say about him. Uh, uh, he wasn't a successful gardener. He was impatient, didn't know how to work. He wanted just, didn't, just wanted the results. He didn't want the results. He didn't want to do the work to get the results. Thought he wasn't good at writing poetry either. Well, there you're right. All right. He wouldn't take instruction about writing poetry. Just wanted praise. There was a glimmer of talent, which there was. He was a good looking, handsome young man who was well-educated and could theoretically write, but he just didn't do what he needed to do. He tried being, uh, he wanted the results, but not the effort to get it. Uh, tried being a screenwriter. Now a man approaching middle age, he was a failure. This is important. 
his diary. He had had a diary, which was, has some really creepy things in that diary, by the way. Um, let's see if I can point out one of the things in his diary. Um, if I can click on the right thing. All right, here we go. If I wanted to kill someone, I would do it. Imagine a powerful spirit. I can't quite read all his writing, but he talks about killing. In his diary, he talks about a lot of creepy things, including he has lots of um, perverted sexual drawings. Um, he could be fun sometimes, but he had, oh, the, it says here, the diary is like watching himself at a third person. And he sometimes thinks of himself in a third person, which I think is interesting because one of the claims of, of what that he had confessed to the murders was in a third person. So he stands outside himself and looks at himself and wonders why he is what he is. But he never really figures it out because that's a sign of a person who can't do that. Um, he had a, supposedly a twisted sense of humor and he uses this concept that he has twisted sense of humor to get out also of all the, he confessed to like 12 people <laughs> that he committed this crime, but he says it was all just a joke. Ireland was an escape from his failure in England. One time he woke up a friend at four in the morning asking why people don't like him. Probably because you wake up people at four in the morning to ask them that question, dude. Um, kept trying to reinvent himself to get people to like him, but no, didn't really work. Wrote in his diary that he wanted a rebirth after Sophie's murder. Now that's one of the theories about why he could, if he was guilty, why he would have committed the crime. I have two theories on it. Ian says he doesn't do friends. Well, yeah, no kidding. And as a social animal, he is, he's constantly out in public because he wants to be seen, but he's not really good with actually having true friends. Um, so he said these, let's look at some of the things he said. So the problem was she's found murdered and somebody obviously attacked her at the door. And, and then the, let me look at the, let me show you the, um, the door again. Uh, I think that the guy did not retreat, come back to the door. I think she was attacked at the door um, right here. I think that she answered the door to somebody because she thought she was like, oh, my God, somebody's in trouble. Somebody needs help. Answer the door. Put his boots on enough to get to the door. Answer the door. And the person attempted to come into the house, whoever that person was. And she blocked that door saying, no, you're not. No, I'm not. It's not going to happen. Pulled, you know, and. And there was a, some kind of fight at the door. Perhaps she was trying to get back into the house to close the door on him. And he pulled the door shut uh, behind her. She, so she never got back in the house. And then there is a statement that there is a fire ax missing from that location. And so it is believed that might have been used. I don't can't prove whether there was a fire ax ever there, but that was the thinking that there was some heavy object um, that then a person started that the person started hitting her. And then she started bleeding. Now, this here, this here is not a finger handprint. It's not a fingerprint. It's a smear. Whether the person who hit her got blood on him and then went like that, or whether she tried to get back in the house and had blood on her hand and went like that, hard to say. Uh, but it looks like more of a smear, and they didn't get any DNA off of it. So uh, I'm sure it's her DNA. I'm sure it's not his DNA. Um, he may have had gloves on. I think this is an overlooked issue because they're looking for... The supposedly Ian has some scratches on his hands and they're saying that that because she ended up in these briar bushes right right at the side here let me show you some of the uh the briar bushes um let's see where are they uh here there's some vicious there are some vicious briars right at the side where she was found um I'm sorry that's not the picture uh yeah those vicious briar bushes um and the question is if if he attacked her and she's running down the driveway and she gets caught, her, it seems like she's trying to get out the gate and she gets caught on it and the briar bushes. And then he beats her many times in the head. And then this thing is smashed on her as a coup de gras. Um, there's a whole bunch of stories about this, this, this uh, cement block supposedly comes from about, I don't from a little distance away from some structure and that only the person who knew that structure could have, known that block would be available. I don't know if any of that's true. Can't figure that part out. But anyway, that was a coup de grace. She was already smashed. Her face was already smashed. She's already lying on the ground like this when he went to get that and smash her. And they're looking for fingerprints. They're looking for, they're looking for uh, damage to the hands of the person who is attacking her. But if the person's wearing gloves and it was a freezing cold night, and I'm going to say, generally speaking, if you go on a really cold night, you might like to have gloves on of some sort. Now, if you have gloves on, 
then you might not have big, huge cuts in your hand. And you're not going to leave fingerprints or handprints because you have your, your hands have gloves on them. Okay, so now could you have the kind of gloves where some of those briars um, could get through to scratch a little bit? Possibly. He had he had scratches on his hands. Um, see if I find that picture. Um, yes. Um, they, they didn't have a camera at the time they were interviewing him, so they, they made these pictures. And the picture shows scratches on his hand. And he also had this ding in his head. And so they thought that, well, he might, you know, the briar bushes scratched him up and then you know, something, you know, when they're fighting, she, he got hit. Now, Ian claims that he was cutting down a Christmas tree and he got scratched up by that and he was killing some turkeys and the turkeys whacked him in the head. Now, those things did occur, supposedly, but is that what caused those injuries to him? Hard to say. And then they said, well, you know, they didn't believe that the, that that the, the cuts, the scratches on his hands were deep enough to come from those briars. But then again, if he was wearing some kind of gloves, there could be some scratches that didn't go, they went through the gloves first and just caused a little scratching. We don't know. Um, but the, the, that didn't end up, they, we know how she was killed. We just don't know again who killed her. Now, now Ian, now there's just st the stories about Ian and why they looked at him as a suspect was, well, he was a journalist that showed up at the scene. He acted strangely. He knew things that he shouldn't know, like that she was French, that uh, before she, he got there, that he, he wrote some articles that said she wasn't sexually assaulted, which was true, but nobody should have known that, but the police and the, and the uh, medical examiner. Um, he, he knew, what was, there's a couple of things he knew that he shouldn't have known. So anyway, they went to talk to him and they, there were, there's this whole bunch of stuff that happened. And this is where it gets very confusing. So they ask whether he, where he was that night. All right. And he says, well, I was home with Jules. We were drinking. We drove home. And interesting enough, on the way they were driving home, they passed this point where they could look over and see Sophie's house and the light in the distance, which I thought was interesting. But then he says this. All right. Um, I went to bed. I went to bed. I stayed in bed all night until the next morning. I never left the house that night. Jules will tell you. Now, this is a statement from him. All right. This is on the 10th. Then he, he started changing his story already. I don't know. I don't know if this is the, the, the times up here are meaningful or not. Sometime after going to bed, I got up, did a bit of writing in the kitchen. So now he's no longer in bed all night. Now he's getting up in the middle of the night and going down to the kitchen. In other words, leaving the person who's his witness got into the kitchen. And then he says, I went down to the studio. Now the studio is not in the house. The studio is in the other house. So he left the house that night, his own words, got up in the night and he left the house that night. She says, this is, this is, this is Jewel's statement. I was in a sleep and Ian was tossing and turning. And then he got up from the bed. Originally she said he was just in bed all night, like he did. And then I would estimate he got up about an hour later. And then she didn't see him till morning, but she had taken a bunch of medication for, for pain. So was she drinking and took medication was completely out of it. Is she covering from, did she know he left and she didn't see him again until eight in the morning? Did she know this stuff? And she's just covering for him, which is why she says people think that we are guilty. Maybe because she's guilty of knowing that he left the house. And now look at, let's look at who she is. She stayed with a guy that she that beats the crap out of her. And she says he just does this when he's drinking and I'm going to block it out and stay with him anyway. Is it possible that he came back and told her I did this terrible thing? I, you know, me, I was drinking. I went out there to talk to this, this woman and she, she, and they know how you blame the victim uh, to the tango, right? That I went to her house and knocked on her door and I was going to, she was a, she's a poet. I'm a poet. I was going to talk to her in the middle of the night because I was drinking. I was kind of like a little irrational and she was like really nasty and she hit me and I hit back because it was just my reaction, you know, to the tango. And then she started screaming and she started running. I thought, oh, my God, if she then I ran after her and I started grabbed her and she hit me again and I hit her again. And oh, my God, now I've really hurt her. And if she goes to the guards. She's going to tell them I assaulted her. I'm going to go to prison for 20 years because they already think they already know I assaulted you, Jules. And now I'm going to go to prison. Oh, my God. That that. I, I, you know, I'm going to go to prison the rest of my life because I made this mistake because I was drinking. And Jules has already, ex 
allowed him to have these mistakes and get a, and 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 put push them aside. Is that what he came back and told her? That's a good question. And uh, would she accept it? Would she lie for him? And I think she is definitely the kind of person who would lie for him. She's she allows him to get away with what he gets away with, and she stays with him. Now she has, by the way, left him after thirty years. Now she says, "I can't take anymore." I don't know what the t t what the problem is now. After thirty years, she said, "I didn't want to leave, leave him when he was in the midst of trying to fight for his, you know, innocence. That'll make him look guilty, right?" But now, after thirty years, I'm done. Okay, I guess he's not providing her with whatever she wants anymore. But I would say she would lie for him. It looks like she. I'm not saying she did lie for him. I'm saying it looks like the type of person who would lie for him because she's, and we'll blame it on his drinking and give him an out and say, well, you know, he didn't mean to do it, but I understand that he said, let's look at what he says. Let's look at his own words. Um, he says this in a third person to a friend. You did it. You killed Sophie. You did it. You saw her in spar on Saturday. You saw her walking up the aisle with her tight arse. You fancied her. You went up to to see what you could get. She ran away screaming. You chased her. You went too far. You had finished her off. He says that to one, that's one of the confessions he made. I went too far. I had to finish her off. Well, there's a reason if it was him, he would have to finish her off. Why? Because she would know who he was. She would rat him out. He's not a complete stranger. It's not like he's some guy passing through town. This is, this is a thing that people... I think people, uh, when they try to say it, there's a there's a woman out here who saw, <laughs> there's a whole nother story. I say it's very complicated. There's a whole nother, there's a woman out here. And let's see if I can find this without messing it up. Um, there's a woman out here. Uh, where is she? Where is she? Don't tell me I've lost her too. Oh, for God's sake. Hold on a second. I'm trying to find, that's him today. I'm trying to find her now. Hmm. Wow. I have, I have, yeah, there she is. Okay. This is the one. Uh, this woman, she claimed, she called in anonymously to, to the guards and she told them right after this happened that she had seen a man on this bridge, this bridge here, I guess, and this guy in a long black coat acting strangely like, like, ah, uh, in the middle of the night, like three in the morning. And she reported this under a fake name. Then later on, they figured out, found out who she was and she stuck for the story. And then she eventually said it was Ian. Ian Bailey. She had seen him. She has a shop in town. She had seen this guy like hanging around. She knew it was Ian Bailey. And she said Ian Bailey then started harassing her, started threatening her. I'm going to kill you, blah, blah, blah. If you keep this telling the story that it was me. And she stuck with her story for a really long time. And then one day she upped and said, that was totally untrue. I never saw Ian Bailey out here. It was some other guy, some, some swarthy guy. So it was short, smaller and thinner and darker skinned. So in other words, a complete stranger. So the, she was, she's an unreliable witness. She gave this very, very strong story to begin with. And, and then she completely flipped years, years later during these, all these trials. Um, is her first story true or is her, is her later stories true? And I, I, they decided she's, she's just unreliable. So you can't believe her no matter what, but, Let's look at the swarthy guy, <laughs> the stranger in town. First of all, the stranger in town has to find Sophie's house. He doesn't, how would he find her house? Why would he find her house? Why would he walk all, if he's got no vehicle, to walk all the way through town, uh, all the way up into the hills to go up there and knock on her door? Why? And if he, and if she answered the door and he, and whatever, they had a fight and she ran away, why would he kill her? She doesn't know who the heck he is. He can just leave, he can just run through the field and she'll never have a clue who he is. It's dark outside. She can't identify him. He could just run away. The fact that he, she, that person smashed her face in as many times as he did and then it could growl with a big, huge brick meant he did not want her to be alive. Either because he hated her with such a passion or because she could identify him. Those are the only two reasons. So I don't know her stories a total crock or not. But originally she, she did call in and say she saw a guy and she thought it was Ian Bailey. So interesting um, that she changed that story. Uh, supposedly a guy in a big, a black coat and all that. And that's something that Ian Bailey often wore. Now there's a whole bunch of stories about that too. So back at his house, um, he had, 
somebody saw a fire out at his house the next day and somebody seeming to be burning up something out in the yard. And that would be, let's see if I can find that picture. Yeah, that's that one. Okay, where is it? Okay, I got to find it. These pictures are very small. I keep pointing out how tiny they are and they're hard to find. Yep, that's the briars. There's the picture. Okay. This one? There we go. All right. So there was an actual burn area behind uh, the house. And they found a whole bunch of things burned up, some buttons and a bunch of other stuff. The question was, was what did he burn up the stuff he wore that night? And they did they did find a black coat and it, what, that wasn't burned up. And, uh, and they didn't find any DNA in that coat. Um, there was somebody who came there and said they saw a coat soaking in water in a big barrel. Did he clean the coat well enough that it wouldn't then show any DNA? Did he knock any? Uh, <laughs> it's hard to say. Did he did he have two coats and burn up one and keep the other? I don't know. When he went out to see her, if he if it was Ian Bradley uh, Bailey, if it was him, did he put on his best coat, the one he loves, or did he put on something that he didn't care about? Now, personally, if I were going now, the question is, if it was him, why would he go there? And that would play into what he might be wearing. Because if he went there for one for one um, theory, then he put his worst clothes on. If he went there for the other theory, he might not put his worst clothes on. So I'm going to get into the two theories. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to tell you about this guy um, before I go on to the theories. Now, the problem, one of the problems with this whole case, um, the next door neighbor, he was a frail guy. He's unlikely that his doctor said he couldn't pick up that heavy, heavy item and, 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 and knock her out. It, that just seemed impossible that he had the strength to commit the crime. So if he didn't have the strength to commit the crime, then it wasn't the next door neighbor. And if it wasn't the next door neighbor, who the heck was it? Was it a hit man from France? Unlikely. So then you have either a complete stranger, just some, some weird guy, just, I don't know, wandering around in the night that does not even know Sophie, doesn't know of Sophie, doesn't know. And if he went up there, why would this guy, if he didn't know who Sophie even was, because her car was there? Why would he take a chance on a man answering the door? Of course, he could have just tried and, you know, because he's crazy. There's always that possibility. But who is this person? Now, there are those who will they say because the that one woman changed her little story that she saw some guy out there and it was some crazy guy. So it's either a crazy guy or it's Ian Bailey. So which one is it? Now, um, Ian Bailey, clearly there, he and his, his partner, Jules, changed their stories about him being at home in bed all night long. The story changed to where he could have left that house, committed a crime, and returned. He said to 12 different people, I did it, I did it, I did it. Uh, I told another guy, bashed her head in, he told another person, he... And he says it was all dark humor. They're like, did you do it? Yeah, I did it. I did it. I bashed it. Hidden. He says it's all dark humor. And he, he is an obnoxious, annoying guy with a big mouth. Maybe it's true. He just said this crap just because that's the way he is. So he might have been getting himself into trouble by being a big mouth. But that certainly played into. He, ha he, he has really no alibi. There's things burned up outside his house. A person did see somebody like looking like him. They thought it was him, even though they changed their story. And he, yeah. So he is a good suspect. So now let me just move on to what are the two theories about why he could have done such a thing. I'll just check in on your comments here. Um, making sure that you still can see me. Um, in the dark, I have hidden in the brambles. Yeah. You know, when you're running away, well, they didn't know the brambles. There weren't that many brambles here, but you know, you just, you know, you, 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 when you run and you're, you're, you're freaked, you don't usually run very much in a straight line. You just, you just start like zigzagging and, you know, you just, your brain doesn't work. You can't see well. Um, it's not only is it dark, but then, you know, the fear just covers your thinking and you just, you just whack into stuff. Um, just whack into stuff. Um, let's see. <laughs> 
Loretta says, I always burn my clothes on the grass when I want to clear out my wardrobe. Doesn't everyone? Well, the, the, then then Jules and he claimed that they were burning up stuff not that night, not the night after, but the month before. But two people, different people said that they saw burning stuff. So you just wonder about that. Um, but it's not proof. And this is the problem. There has never been specific DNA proof. Now, why, if he, if he killed her, why isn't his DNA there? Well, my, my, I've said this over and over again. DNA does not actually show up at every scene. The, the victim's DNA, yes. She even had her hand clenched with hair, and it was her own hair. So that, and that usually it is the victim's own hair and not, not the killer. So what you wish it was, but it, mm. now he did give up his DNA readily, his fingerprints, his DNA. He didn't, he didn't object because he said, I didn't do it. So here, take my stuff, which is very, seems that's one of the reasons they said, well, we think he's innocent. That's, that's the, not, not the guards, but they're the overling, you know, the, the people over who are going to decide if it goes to prosecution, DPP. Um, they said, well, he's willing to give that up. Therefore, it's interesting. The DPP, if that's the correct name of it, <laughs> um, they seem to believe everything that he said and Jewel said and discount everything everybody else said. I think that that was weird to me. I understand why they may think there's not enough to go to, to trial, but the fact that they discounted every single other person in town who said he said these things that were all concerning. Everything he's done has been concerning. Every one of those people, they just disregarded. So I don't like the way they dealt with it. I understand why they might not go to trial, but I think the fact that they would just automatically believe him and Jules and nobody else seems a little quirky to me, um, to be nice. So, but yes, a lot of times if you're using a weapon and you're not actually physically strangling, you're phys not physically punching, you're not actually getting your DNA on them because you have that space, it's an object that's hitting them, not you. So you, and you're wearing a hat, gloves, coat, you're covered, you know, you're going to get blood, their blood on you perhaps. And there, there was also a story about him, uh, somebody supposedly in a stream, like washing up. Do I know if that's true or not? Again, I don't know. Um, but you, you can get rid of your outer clothes and you can either destroy them, wash them. There's different things you can do that maybe you're going to end up with not having that victim's DNA on you. And it happens more often than people want to believe. So either he's totally innocent and the reason they don't have anybody is because it was some whack job coming through town who just killed her for no freaking reason at all because she wasn't even sexually assaulted. So usually when you get that kind of situation, you don't have somebody just kill somebody for no reason. You know, this, uh, a sexual homicide is a reason. It's a, it's a serial killer's thrill. But just to go up to a door and knock on it and then drag the woman out and, and then beat her to death in the lane and walk away seems weird for a complete stranger who doesn't even know who she is. What, what? In the middle of the night? I mean, it's just now the guy living next door, if she had been killed, not in the middle of the night, I'd be more likely to believe the guy next door could have done it um, in the sense that let's say he came over during the day. And she was sitting in the house and they, he said, Hey, I want to talk to you because I'm having problems with what you're doing on the property. And they got into an argument and he picked up something and hit her. I believe that more, but I don't think the next door neighbor is pissed enough at her that he's going to sneak in and sneak over there in the middle of the night, knock on her door and, and brutally kill her. I think that's just a little not likely for a frail six guy in his sixties that isn't, has no history of any of anything negative. <laughs> He has a history of things negative, so he has more of the propensity to do something like that. But the question will be, so I will say this again. There is no physical proof putting in there. There is lots of his his, his um, confessions, but not to the police, but to other people. He has confessed. So that puts you in the spotlight, Ian, and I don't feel sorry for you. And if you think you were doing humorous things, you thought it was amusing I mean, I'm a, I, I like black humor too, but I'm going to say that I'm never going to say I killed somebody, you know, like my next door neighbor is killed and I'm going to make them a, a joke about how I bludgeon them to death. That is not something you do unless maybe you did it. <laughs> so what is the theory behind if he did it? And I'm going to put the big if out. If he was actually the killer, what would be the motive? What do you think before I go to my two theories on this? I'm curious to see what you think the motive might be because it's, it is 
a little weird. Um, let's see what you, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I uh, can't figure that one out. Um, hold on a second. Uh, he wouldn't worry about washing up at home with the missus. Well, not if she, not a, especially if she is going to cover for him. She might have helped him. That's one of, I, I find it interesting again that she says, we, they think we are guilty. I don't know how many people think she's involved. Why would she say that? Does she feel guilty about something? I think that's uh, interesting. Um, rejection. Okay. Rejection. But why would he, why would she reject him when he doesn't, she, supposedly he didn't even know her, that he'd never met her. This is, and nobody really says that he met her except for, all right, except for the neighbor up on the hill. Um, he went and did some gardening for him like a year and a half prior, supposedly, or a year prior, did some gardening for him. And while he was there, that neighbor pointed out Sophie to him and said, oh, that's a lady, the French lady who, who has bought the house next door. She was obviously outside. They're both outside. And they was pointing her out. Or it's possible they actually were introduced to each other. And that this story gets very vague, that they were introduced. He says he knows of her and has seen her. But that was that maybe that one time. So that's very vague again. Now, mind you, she comes into town. Now, he lives in that town. He's all over that town, drinking, drinking, drinking. She rolls into town, usually with somebody. I have a hard time believing he doesn't know who she is, especially since he's a drinker and he's, he's always in the bars. And he sees this woman come in. She blows in from France. And she's, a, I think, an attractive woman. So she comes in. Um, and she's, people know who she is. He, he might run into her in the store. He might run into her and she's a poet. Supposedly one of her friends later on said she had said she had met a poet and they said, oh, this guy. And she said, no, 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 not this guy, but some other guy. She goes, no, 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 not him. He's also, he, he no. And she sort of describes him. So did she actually meet him? And he, no, she's dead. She can't say whether she did or she didn't, but maybe she did meet him somewhere. They talk poetry, whatever, because they have that in common. Both of them are poets. Um, and she knew who he was. So if he knocks on the door and says, it's Ian, it's Ian, I need to talk to you. She might go, what the heck? That, that's the poet guy? What? She might open the door. And he doesn't, then he would know her. Also, the other thing is, if she came to town without somebody this one time, he might well know that. If he's hanging around and he's in a, in a restaurant, if he's in a if he's in a shop and she's talking to people and they're like, oh, did your son come with you? She goes, oh, no, I couldn't find anybody to go with me this time. Somebody overhears that they will know she's up in this house alone, that she doesn't have anybody with her. He could have overheard that. He could have heard talk. Oh, yeah, that Sophie lady's in town. She's not with Remember, he's in a bar half the time. He talks to everybody in town. I think there's no reason why he would not know that she's up there, that he very well knows she's up there alone. So I think that is reasonable that she he knows she's up there. Um, as far as rejection goes, there's no, there's no evidence that they spent time together. There's no evidence that they actually, you know, he actually made a pass at her or anything like that. Although he has some very concerning um, sexual ideations, shall we say, in his writings and in his drawings. He's kind of creepy. So um, it's possible he had some sexual ideations about her, that he saw her and thought it would be nice to have her. That's very possible that she rejected him in town. We don't have proof of, but that she might've rejected him when they showed up at the house is a possibility. So that's one of the possibilities. Um, let's see. He killed her for being a better poet. <laughs> Poets do that all the time. <laughs> they're, they're, but there's actually a point to that. Now, that's one of parts of one of my theories is that status wise, she was up here and he was down here. I'm going to bring that up in just a little bit. Um, she worked without the need to be admired, had no work ethic. Oh, he had no work ethic, but thought everyone should admire him for existing. This is very true, Harper. So she was very well liked and very well respected. He, not so much. She was highly successful in, in the work that she did. He, not at all. So he certainly would know she was somebody was up on a pedestal. And he was in the pit, you know, as people are like, but, oh, but Sophie, but Sophie, but Sophie. Yes. I definitely think that, that, that is very true. Um, he was a nobody. 
pretty much. That is true. He was a nobody. Um, no wonder he's pissed. Yeah, <laughs> he was a total failure, basically. Um, vocational jealousy. That's an interesting. Oh, clear. Oh, wait. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Things are moving quickly on me here. Vocational jealousy. Yes, you can be jealous of somebody who's been more successful in your in your line of work than than you. And you know, it, it's 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 not something we we all we all deal with that sometimes. I mean, it's a it's a frustrating thing when somebody's made it and you haven't made it as far as they've made it. And some people say, well, people comment on that with me. They're like, oh, you're just jealous of John Douglas because John Douglas is. John Douglas, he's you know, the most famous FBI profiler. He's written tons of books. He gets every sh sh show and pro profiling show coming out. He gets hired as a as a consultant. Am I jealous of him? Well, there's parts of me that go, damn it. <laughs> I don't get that kind of accolades. I don't. I'm not as well known as him. I don't. Yeah, that. Yeah. Now, does he deserve what he gets? Well, he did work hard. He became an agent. Then he became a profiler. He worked in the, the behavioral science unit. I don't agree with his profiling. And I personally am not fond of a lot of his uh, books. <laughs> I'm not fond. But putting that aside, he did work hard to get where he got. And he deserves what he, he deserves to be. He, he deserves it. I mean, and, and I, I'm a kind of a renegade late, kind of more like him, <laughs> you know, didn't go through the channels. Um, and I'm never going to probably have that kind of stuff that John Douglas has. And I, I, I accept that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. That's okay with me um, because that's the way life goes, <laughs> but I accept life. I don't know that he accepted life and took any, that he didn't take it personally, you know, um, let's see. Uh, but just, does. <laughs> But does Douglas own his own limousine business? That's a whole other story, folks, who haven't been around. Um, you would never wear that yellowish jacket. What yellow jacket? I'm not sure. I didn't know what that means. Let me let me check out more things before I go to the two theories. All right. Um, oh, yeah. She looks nice. What is Pat concealing? He looks dodgy. <laughs> I don't think, you know, a lot of times when he was younger, he didn't look dodgy. He looked very, very very nice. It was a good looking man. I mean, he was, I mean, I, I personally think so. I, I think that sometimes when we know, when we, when we have suspicions of people, then we start thinking badly about them, but let me see where, where's my, uh, general pictures of him. Yeah, there he is. Okay. I, I, I first saw him in, in a video and he looks like a young, nice uh, man in his thirties, uh, an appealing fellow. I mean, not, not unappealing, tall and tall. He speaks extremely well. So I'm going to give you two theories. I'm going to curious what you think the two, the, the, what you think the possibilities on these two theories are. Okay. Now, mind you, I can't prove either of these theories. They're just ideas because one thing that happens, I, I, I actually speak against this a lot is you, you want to be careful making up too many crazy romanticized stories and then think that's true. So I'm not saying this is true. I'm just saying if this guy were guilty of the crime, I can only come up with two theories. The first one, which did occur to me, was that this guy is a failure in life. He tried to be a journalist, failed, failed, failed. He goes to Ireland and he does some work around Ireland, but he's not doing well. And he, he's trying, right before she's murdered, he try, he's trying to get back into journalism. So the thought to me was, does he just need a big story? Is that the reason? Because she's a, she, would, she would be a big story. She's up there by herself, attractive woman. She's a French woman. If somebody killed her, brutally murdered her, this would be a huge story. And he's going to be the guy the story goes to because he's the local journalist. Is this his way of trying to reinvent himself that he talks about? Now, he actually says this. And it's funny because I thought of this concept that if, if he's got some kind of personality disorder, <clears throat> And he, this, he needs to make it, and he doesn't care about what other people go through. He doesn't have empathy for other people. A collateral damage for his career might be perfectly acceptable. So I did think about that as a possibility. And he said this. Let me find it. Where is the thing he said? Oh, please let me find it. Okay, not that one. 
Yeah. Am I going to have problems again here? Yes, I am. Mm -mm. I will have to read it from someplace else because it didn't show up here. Um, all right. He said, let me find what he said. Um, somebody had been questioning him about why he would do. Oh, no, I forgot to put it up. I knew I forgot. Oh, there it is. I found it. Okay. Editor, he said this to an editor. A former newspaper news editor has told the high court she did not consider Ian Bailey was engaging in black humor when he told her, it was me, I did it, I killed her to resurrect my career. And I did not read that before I came up with that theory because when I'm reading about his failing life all the way through, how he failed as a journalist, failed as this, failed as that, I thought to myself, he still wants to be a journalist. He just doesn't, because he's failing as a poet now. And he's gone to Ireland and he's a crappy poet. So now he's like, I want to resurrect my journalism career. And that's where he decided to start doing that was right before Sophie got killed. So would he be willing to commit a horrific murder in order to be the first journalist on the, on the, on the scene? Uh, I think that's a plausible theory. What do you think? And I'm going to go to theory number two, because there's only one thing that sends me away from that theory at all. If he were, if he were guilty, um, third person again. Yeah. He, he does a lot of third person crap. Um, he does. It's very weird. Um, black humor there. Uh, it's, it's a little odd. Um, I can't see. <laughs> Would he risk himself though? Why not? He's a failure. Understand when people are desperate, when they, then they think, hey, I and he he thinks he can get away with stuff. He's gotten away with beating up his woman and he didn't get put in prison for that. He gets away with stuff. He uses people. He does get away with things. Um, did he think he could get away with it? What, away with it? Nobody will see him do it. Maybe. And then he just slips back into the house, gets rid of the evidence, and says, Oh, nobody's gonna suspect me, and I'll be the first journalist on the case. I'm gonna resurrect my career here. It'll be the biggest story. He only had one big story before in his career and it helped him greatly. So this is, if this happened, it would help him theoretically, if he didn't become a suspect, which kind of screwed him over then. Um, when you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. Very good poet Zimmerman. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, well, she gave him notoriety for real. She did do that, Clarissa, um, because he ended up being a suspect. And the question is, if he did, if it was him and he did it for that reason, did he just have that arrogance that he would never be suspected? And I think he's arrogant enough to think that. He's worked on crime stuff before, so he would understand get, about getting rid of evidence and not leaving evidence. He would understand that. So I find that interesting. Um, uh, I think he wanted to meet her with her to discuss screenplay or poetry or whatever. She canceled on him because he's a weirdo and he gets angry and goes to confront her after drinking. Interesting. Uh, and that's possible. Now, she did not mention that to her husband during that hour long talk, but it may not have rang to her as being very important. She may have, like you say, just brushed him off. Um, he ran into her. She brushed him off. And he's like, that's great. And then he goes out drinking. He's like, well, that, that's not going to happen. You know, I'm, I'm going to go and yeah, I, I'm going to I'm going to show her who's who um, that it's um, that has possibilities. I wouldn't say it's true, but it has possibilities now. There's another thing that I find a statement that he keeps making. I went too far. I went too far. And now I'm trying to think, what does that possibly mean? Um, he went too far. What? Because if he went out, if he went out there with a the concept, if he were guilty, if he were guilty, went out there with a the concept of killing her, that would be premeditated. And he did not bring any weapons with him. He did, the person who did that did not bring weapons. Um, there were weapons that were just, will happen to be there. Um, if he planned this and it was premeditated, um, why would he say and went too far? If that, if that's even, if that means anything, because again, when he says a lot of stuff that he claims it's just, uh, you know, he's just being sarcastic. I went too far. If you go planning to kill somebody, you can't go further than that because that's your premeditation. Your plan to kill them. That is how far you're going to go. But if he thinks he went too far, what would be the too far? 
So I have one more theory. Um, and I'm just going to throw it out there. Uh, and again, one of the things about theories, I want to point this out too. Even sometimes people who kill do not know what their actual motive is. As for, I, I'm going to talk about motives, not theories. Motives. People have mixed motives sometimes. They have they come up with a crazy motive and they follow that. Or they come up with a sort of motive and they half follow that. Or they have two motives that they mix together. Or they don't even know why the heck they did it. So the motives are really tricky. And that's why you don't have to have them to be in a court of law. Because how are we going to know what's in that guy's mind? How does he even know what's in his mind? So is his motive a premeditated murder so he can get his career back on track? That's a theory. That that's what his motive is. There's no proof of this. This is just a theory of what a motive could be. So my other theory for what a motive could be is this a rather odd theory. And the reason I bring this up is because he is a poet. And he's, a, and he, and he's, a, and he's from England, okay? And there is a very popular story in England. And let me, let me share that with you. Wuthering Heights. Now, when we take a look at the story of Wuthering Heights, we have... Uh, a woman who is much, uh, much over him in class and, and he is um, taken in and made a servant in the home of the woman. And that is one reason she rejects him is because he's lower than her. So, um, and I say, this is of course a, a super, hold on a second, uh, a super famous story that every poet and every person study who ever read literature would know, especially if they're obviously from, from, from uh, England. Um, so wait, hold on a second. I'm losing my thing here. Where is it? Where is it? I've now I've lost things again. Oh, driving myself crazy today. Okay. Ah, all right. So here we have. All right. Who do we have here? We have Heathcliff and Kathy. Or do we have Heathcliff and Kathy? Kind of a striking resemblance in a way, isn't it? All right, so one of the things about the whole story of, of Heathcliff and Kathy is that she they live on the moors in this this old house on the moors. Now I looked up where where they're living in, you know, in uh, this location, Ireland, and I put in moors in Ireland, and although many people consider there are no moors in Ireland, they certainly look sort of moorish, shall we say. All right? This is moorish enough. All right? So she's on this. She lives in this house. Look at look at where she's living. Out on the, Essentially out on the moors somewhere. Out on the moors. And he's a romantic in a sense of his poetry. And here's a woman, now she's in town, and he has a fancy for her because he said in one of his, uh, one of his um, confessions, quote, that she had a nice arse and he fancied her. Well, if he saw her and knew she was alone up there, Kathy is alone on the moors, and I, Heathcliff, will go to her. Because he's drunk. As we're talking about he's, he's, he drinks heavily. He gets up in the night and thinks he's going to go over there and, like I said, go, go and share poetry with her at one in the morning. An idiot thing to think, but he's, he's not exactly um, stable. So he goes, he goes to her house and he knocks on that door. And she comes out and she's like, what the heck? And she rejects him. She does reject him. And why does he, she reject him? Because she's what? Better than him? Higher class than him? More successful than him? And she's just going to out and out reject him? And he cl closes that door behind her and, and goes after her? And then she runs and he kills her because he's gone too far and she knows who he is and he has to kill her? Is he a brute like Heathcliff? Is she a snob like Kathy? It's an interesting theory because of him being, both of them being poets and this being such a famous story. 
no, he, he's never, I, I looked to see if he was big on to the, in the Wuthering Heights uh, book. I haven't seen any of that, but personally, I hate the book with a passion. I can't stand any of the characters. I think they're all appalling, um, just dreadful people. Um, and I didn't care if all of them got killed, but that's just me. I'm not a Wuthering Heights fan. And uh, the, this is this one really pissed me off, uh, this version with Laura, Laurence Olivier. Uh, and then this version um, I liked better. Um, and I thought, oh, was it Timothy Dalton? I thought he was a better, um, a better uh, Heathcliff. And I personally, I thought this was a much better version, which is Dil Daya Dardlia. Uh, Laya. Uh, this is a, a famous actor, Dilip Kumar, and Wahida Raymond, who's a very beautiful woman. This is the Hindi version <laughs> of Wuthering Heights. And at least you don't hate them. So, and they changed it to a happy ending. So um, you, you can skip, you, there were more reasons why they did what they did. So you didn't hate the two main characters, but in this one, I hated both of them. So personally, and the book, it's just one of the worst my opinion, the worst books ever written. Um, couldn't make it through it. I think it's dreadful. But but in this guy's mind, who uh, who likes to to fantasize things, romanticize things, and uh, exaggerate things and exaggerate himself, I'm not saying this is true. I'm not saying this is really what was in his mind. But it's an interesting concept. If you're going for, if he were guilty. And he didn't plan this as a premeditated homicide to put, bolster his career, to get his career back on track. If he just saw her and knew she was alone up there, got drunk, and, and Jules was no good that night, and he was all pissed at Jules, did he just grab his flask, leave the house, go, go walking through the moors till he found his Kathy, and then she rejected him, and he brutalized her? Did he go too far? That's a theory. It's, a, it's an interesting visualization. Is it true? Can't say that it is. But um, when I look at uh, who, did it, who did it, I mean, it's either a complete stranger just wandering through town, <laughs> just happened to end up there, or it's somebody like him, who at least I can come up with two theories and two motives even if I can't prove it, either one of them and don't know which one could even be true. And there is not enough to convict him. And I agree, there's may not be even enough to take him to court. So I see that if people do get away with things, uh, but as a suspect, he's still number one, in my opinion. And he's made himself number one by uh, confessing to a ton of people and by being who he is. And so I don't feel sorry for him. A lot of people feel sorry for him. Oh, poor dear, you know, he's like, he struggled through all these years. I don't feel sorry. Not when, not when people behave the way they do. He brutalized his the, the woman he lived with. And right at that moment, he should have been in prison. But she let him off. Maybe she hadn't let him off. Maybe this crime wouldn't have happened. Let me check out your comments here. So what do you think of those uh, those theories? <laughs> I know they're a little different, but... um. Let's see. <laughs> no, 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 not Lady Chatterley. <laughs> let me let me roll back up here. Some of more of your comments up here. Um, I'm I'm glad I never read it. Oh, just I, I honest to God, I I love I love classical literature, and that book was just the worst. There's not one redeeming human being in it, and and it's boring. And I it yet. Many people think it's the best book ever written. So it's like you're either on one side or the other. So if you love that book, bully for you. It's just my opinion. But <laughs> okay, somebody on my side. <laughs> oh, they they made you read that horrible book in grade eight. Ugh. Now usually make you read it in like high school. I don't know why they want to make you read this horrible book. I mean, and they're horrible people. And yet people think it's the most wonderful love story ever. It's not a love story. The guy's a, the, the guy's a guy. The, the, I will say this. That guy's a psychopath. The one in, in, in the story there. The, uh, you know, um, in, in the book, he is unquestionably, or Heathcliff is unquestionably a psychopath. And he's obsessed with her as, a, as his, 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 uh, 
is his prize. He wants his prize. And she's a nasty little piece of work. Um, and and she, she, she basically causes him to hate her. And it's just, it's just a nasty little book. <laughs> I just don't understand it. <laughs> the oh, Bron Moore's Bronte sisters are very dreary. Oh my goodness, I don't know. <laughs> I agree, Pat. Children should be required to read this utterly appalling classic. Yeah, there's great classics out there. David Copperfield is wonderful. Love David Copperfield. That's a that's a good book. Moby Dick, great book. Lots of great books out there. This is this is not one of them. Um, a prof said it was the greatest novel in the English language. Oh my gosh, I, I yeah, it, it is considered that, and it's got way more five star reviews than one star reviews. But the one star reviews on Amazon are quite amusing. <laughs> but it's it's a well known story. That that's a fact. Um, I think he might be out of touch with the reality. No, no, he's not psychotic. And even the, the, the um, none of the, the uh, psychologists said he was psychotic. They said they had things like borderline personality disorder, things like that. No, he's the level of narcissism that he does exhibit, which is very high, puts him either on the border of borderline personality disorder to shove over to psychopathy. But I'm not a psychologist, so Ian, I'm not saying you are a psychopath. But the out of touch of reality? No. See, what happens is a psychotic is, doesn't understand reality. But a psychopath doesn't like reality and won't accept reality and doesn't see himself properly in that reality. That's the problem. He just, the fact is he's so into himself that other people, he thinks he's, that, is that out of, I don't know, you know, it's, um, in a, in a sense, you're right. In some senses, you're not seeing things realistically. If you think you're something that you're not, but grandiose thinking is part of psychopathy. So, and that, is that reality? If you actually ask them, it's funny because he'll even say at some point, yeah, maybe I'm not a good poet. I'm like, he, can, he maybe you, you find you know he does know he just doesn't want to admit there's two different things um well that's true his own reality is clearly he's king there well he's living with a woman he can beat up and she lets him stay he's king there he can go to a bar drink and give his poetry and apparently nobody's got the balls to say dude stop it there was even a part of the show. I think it was in the uh, the Irish version of the uh, the the murder uh, murder at the cottage um, version, um, where he's his, his, Jules. It's Jules' birthday, and there's a birthday party at like a bar, and he's like taking over everything, and he's the star of the whole thing. And she's just sitting off there, going, "Well, you know, it's basically going to be about him, not me," and that would be correct. Um, um, that was a great read that is true Sarah I'll go with you on that one definitely um, uh, Bluebell says I hate women who enable their abusive partners her enabling possibly holds her responsible for Sophie's death if it were Bailey yeah I mean, I mean there's those two sides to the story which is one that women who allow abuse cannot help themselves. They don't know how to, they emotionally are unable to fight back against their abusers. There's that belief. Um, then there's the other side of it, which says you're so desperate for companionship, you'll accept being abused. And I mean, there's always this kind of weird level that I think all of us human beings, uh, especially if it's not physical abuse, like emotional abuse type thing, somebody's, you know, in a marital relationship, for example, isn't or you know, any kind of partner relationship where your partner or even a friend treats you a little bit not so nice but you stay in their relationship because you value certain things about that relationship uh that you want to keep so you ignore 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 those things or you accept okay it's not that person's not perfect so i'll accept that abuse toward me because i'm a strong person i can handle that abuse and still get the other benefits out of the relationship a lot of people do that with emotional abuse. When it gets to physical abuse, I, 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 that always floors me because touch me once and you'll never touch me again. 
Because once you touch me, I will be on the other side of that door or you will be on the other side of that door. And to be beaten so badly that I got to go get surgery on my dang eye, I will never have anything to do with you again. But, but his partner did and she stuck it out for 30 freaking years. So I just wonder if you're, she's willing to do that and willing not to press charges and willing to be beaten again, what will she do for him if he happened to kill somebody else because he went too far? So, yeah, it's not a love story. It was an obsession story. It was a creepy story. Ugh. Creepy, creepy, creepy. Um, and not in a way that resolved in, so that you would think, you know, there's, it's one thing to have obsession stories and it proves out at the end that the personality disorders of the people show how things work out. And then, you know, what bothers me is they made it into a romantic story with people that really weren't romantic. It was sick. It was a sick story. And yet it wasn't presented that way in the end. Um, so I'm, I'm bothered by that, uh, that there's no learning. There's no, there's no, there's no, Hey, there's just like, Oh, and they should be together. Yeah. So, mm. yeah okay. <laughs> it's just sick. Um, can you, how can you be delusional, not psychotic? Psychotic means you see things that, that simply are not true. Not your, not your opinion of them. Like, it's one thing if you think, if he thought he was Jesus Christ, literally thought he was Jesus Christ, that would be psychotic. If you look at my recent video about the guy who claims he's Jesus Christ with a kind of a smirk on his face, uh, the, that was the, um, the uh, 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 what was that called? Um, twin, what was it called? Twin Flames, the Twin Flames video where you got this this creepy couple and they're just suckering people into, you know, their cult. And he's a con artist. He knows what he says is garbage. It's a con artist. There's a difference between believing something and being a con artist. And for him, does he really think he's a great poet? I don't think so because, and I don't think he thinks he's a great journalist. I think he's realistic about that. I think he likes to pretend that he's bigger than he is, that he has the capabilities of being bigger than he is. But I don't think, I think he actually knows exactly what he is, um, but he's annoyed by it. He's annoyed. He uses women. He abuses women. And that, that I, that I can say that without being um, uh, sued. He uses women because they put him up in a house and give him a place and he's, he can do his little, whatever he does without having to pay his share. Um, and he's obviously abused women and gotten away with it. And he just blames it on them. He says, well, you know, I know I did it. He doesn't say he didn't do it. He just says, you know, part of it's her fault. Well, maybe because she stays and she annoys me. Um, so I don't think he's delusional. I think he's just got, he just, he just wants attention. He loves attention. And does he get attention? He does in his own way. I think he'd like better attention. If he, if he had the energy to do things correctly, I think I pointed this out in other videos where you have a con artist who has the capability of like getting a PhD and being a, a really successful person, but they skip the whole thing and then they just pretend they have a PhD and lie about it because they love, they, they're, not, they're not stupid people. They're smart people who could do it, but they don't want to bother and they think it's more fun to fool everybody out there. Well, I'm smart enough to have a PhD. I'm going to tell you I have a PhD and you're going to believe I have a PhD. And therefore, yeah, it's a con game. And so you can, you can, you can fake things. Now, as he gets older and older and he's got his little, you know, he's now he, his, his, his uh, jewels have dumped him and locked him out of the house. So I don't know how he's surviving now um, because he doesn't have much to sell and he's in his sixties. So, you know, he, yeah, he might define himself another woman. Who knows? Um, <laughs> twin flames, don't get me started. Yeah, not, not, let's not do that one here. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Uh, whoop, whoop, hold on a second. Uh, so, oh, I found, I found the book to have a menacing undercurrent. Yes, that book did. Um, that's, oh, 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 wait a minute. Um, Clarissa says he loves all the attention he gets when he goes to town to do his business. He, he, he's, why don't you have to give him credit for one thing? He's found a way to get attention no matter what. No matter what, he finds a way. 
whether it's in a bar doing his poetry, whether he's uh, whether he's being a journalist, whether he's being accused of being a killer. He says he hates it, but he's in every video. He goes to court. He doesn't he didn't just quietly go away. He could have quietly gone away. He didn't. He's out there. He loves the attention one way or the other. He likes to get the attention. And he doesn't like it when he doesn't get the attention. And he doesn't like it when somebody somebody makes him look bad. So um, Loretta says, the murder. this murder shows why you must always be on your guard. Sophie probably never imagined this could happen to her at her lovely Irish getaway. Yeah, and no, there hadn't been a crime like this in what? Forever? So this felt like a super safe place that... It was, it was beautiful. People were friendly. I mean, the town sounds great. I wouldn't mind going to visit and hanging out of the town and getting staying at this beautiful location. Um, I mean, it just it looks like a wonderful place. When, when they describe how the people interact there, it just sounds great. Um, and since most people aren't getting murdered, like it's not like death in paradise where people arrive on, on the island and they get killed within a day, <laughs> you know, and you wonder why they have any tourism business. Um, in this case, nobody had been killed. And so this was such a bizarre crime. And it was. It wasn't a domestic that we know of. It wasn't uh, people doing drugs. Uh, it wasn't a robbery gone bad, a burglary gone bad. What the heck was it? And that's why, it's, that's why it is such a mystery. What the heck was the motive? The motive is, I think, the biggest issue in this case. Because I've given you two for this guy. And for somebody, just a stranger rolling through town, I can't even come up with one. I mean, crazy people can do crazy things, but I just can't. The, the sequence of this crime, the time of this crime, the fact that she normally wouldn't even be here. It, it just seems to me, I can't, I can't buy this as just a complete stranger rolling through town. So it has to be somebody there. Now, the second best uh, suspect would be the neighbor. Uh, would be, but they supposedly checked him out entirely. He's, and he didn't have the strength to commit the crime. He had no real reason to commit the crime, even though he had some grudges. I, I don't. I don't think that the neighbor did it. He's now dead. He's he's deceased. Um, and I think his wife is now selling the house, so she's I don't know, she's moving someplace else. But um, the I I yeah I I'd, I'd say he's he will be the second best suspect because at least he's got a connection to her. Um, he would have been actually the first, he would have been the best suspect if he had anything else that made me think he did it uh, because of the, because of the, obviously he's right there. Um, but I, I don't see anything that links him to that crime. And when you take away the neighbor, there's just who's left except this fellow. <laughs> uh, uh, I would, um, it seems a bit odd for a complete stranger to wander up there, open up the gate, go up the hill to a house with a car where you assume most of the time you're going to assume there's a man in that, that place as well. And you know, that that man might fight back and the guy didn't bring a weapon with him. So it's not like he was coming into the house with a weapon. He didn't have one. And he didn't even get in the house. Yeah. It's just, um, Rage, rejection, stalking, perhaps. I mean, again, we can't we can't really prove it um, because it seems to be so much. It, it, it's really the lack of physical evidence. I think that just did this that did this in because I say no alibi, lots of confessions, personality, two possible motives, but the one missing thing, which was in spite of all of those things, can I personally say he committed the crime? And I cannot, I can just say he's still my top suspect <laughs> for one of those motives or the other. Um, and maybe the lady that said she saw him felt she could be next and change her statement. Well, you know, it's really hard to know. It's such, this whole thing about that woman is so bizarre. Um, it's just, yeah. Is it, is it, is, well, she stuck with that statement a really long time. And she was saying that he was coming into her place and threatening her over and over and over again, going <laughs> and all kinds of things. Now, the problem is if you ever watch him, one of these videos, that guy can get very angry and can say a lot of crap. If, if he were innocent, I can see him threatening her. 
if he were guilty, I can see him threatening her. So I don't can't say that his threatening her proves that he's guilty because he's just that kind of guy. Um, if I would think if, if, if she was scared of him, if she really thought if she really knew it wasn't him, she would have early on said, gone back to the police and said, look, I, that's just not him. But she stuck with that story for so darn long. And suddenly, years, years, years later, she goes, oh, none of that's true. I made it up. What? It's not him. He never threatened. And she, it's not only she said it wasn't him. She said he never threatened her ever. He never did any of those things. So she's a big fat liar about that too. She made all of that. She says the guards made her say these things because they, they thought it was him. So they, when, she, when, they, when she called in that she saw a guy out there, it wasn't him, but they got her to con convinced her to say it was him and then added all those things on to make it look like it was him. Is it possible? Yes. Is it possible she saw some other guy out there? Sure. Is it possible she did see him, but actually never could really prop properly identify him because she's driving along at night. I'm, you know, I don't know how well you see people at night. She said he, there was a claims that she said he was five foot eight when he's really over six feet and blah, blah, blah. But again, you're driving along at night and you see some guy in a coat. Who knows whether he's crouching down, whether he's moving around, whatever. Do you, could she have actually seen him, but couldn't properly identify him? But then when she saw him in town, she thought, oh my God, that could be him. So she told him, I think it is him. It, it's really hard to say. I do believe she saw somebody, but I just, I can't identify exactly who it is or why she changed her mind. Um, um, yeah, most people don't answer the door unless they're expecting somebody. Well, no, I, think I do. <laughs> we got Amazon coming here. We got, yeah, we do. Um, I, I have, I have to say, I, I, I don't know that I would do it if I were up on that hill in the dark, somebody beating on my door it would kind of freak me out. Um, uh, but I, again, maybe I thought it was my, if I think it's the neighbor and they're, they're, they're having some kind of problem, I might, I might, you know what I mean? I might run down and think, oh my God, somebody's hurt. I, I need to help them. Huh? I might, hard to say. Um, well, we're talking too many years ago, you know, that that's, you know, that's like having cameras and stuff. And now a lot of people have more precautions with the, with the, with the, all the kinds of cameras. And that's very useful and very it provides a lot of extra safety, or at least can identify the person who kills you. That's nice. Um, but we're talking way back when, and they didn't have the cameras. And so there is no digital stuff, which would be great. Cause they could, if they had cameras, we could see if he was driving down the road in his car. Um, he could have, I mean, if she's, if his, if, if Jules is knocked out, taking drugs is knocked out, he could, you know, he could have taken the car. It doesn't mean he had to walk all the way there, although it wasn't that far. It's supposedly about three miles. Um, I heard 20 minutes, but I think it's more like an hour, but you know, you got nothing better to do in the middle of the night and you're drunk drinking. What's three miles? No, it's not far for a guy. He could walk that easily and, you know, probably 45 minutes, uh, on a, you know, so He'd be there, do what he does, and he'll walk his way back. He'd never have to take the car. No noise would be started up there. But then again, if she's completely out of it, maybe he did take the car. Maybe he drove the car part way and didn't drive the car the rest of the way, parked it and walked up the rest of the way so his car wouldn't be seen. But if there were cameras, we'd see a dude walking along the road, or we'd see a car come along the road. Well, without cameras, all you got is this woman whose story keeps changing. So what a mess. Um yeah, December 1996. So almost 30 years ago and chilly. Very cold. Um, you think he took the car? Eh, Might have. But again, uh, the, the, the issue with that would could be if you take the car, then when you get back into the car, the question is, do you have... Um, do you, do you bring evidence into the car, like her blood into your car? That's always a big problem. Now, some people are smart enough. I don't know if a person is trash drunk, uh, is smart enough, but you can always take trash bags and bring a, se a separate set of clothing, change out of whatever, put it in a trash bag, change into new clothing, and then get in the car. That's a lot of work. Um, I don't know. I tend I tend to think he's more likely to just walk across the moors, but I don't know. You know, we're not going to be able to to prove it, and uh, apparently the police aren't either, so that doesn't seem to work. Oh. Uh, 
yeah, this is a claim. She was too, she was scared to say too much because of her marriage. This is the woman. She supposedly was out with another guy and not her husband. That's the claim. And therefore she didn't want to say who she was out with. But why would she change her story? I still, I don't understand why the story changes. I mean, unless the guy with her committed the crime. <laughs> um, uh, whoops. Uh, Harpa says, I don't think he would commit a well thought out crime. Well, um, he has a little bit, if you see the place he lives in, it's a mess and his mind seems to be kind of a mess and he seems to be very volatile. So I tend to think, yes, I don't think it, I, I tend to think I agree with that. I don't, if he committed the crime, I don't think he would be so you know, perfect and careful. I think he'd be more likely driven by his own crazed kind of thinking that he would have. And I don't mean crazed by crazy. I just mean by whatever he feels is something that's going to bolster his ego at that time. Um, now, if he decided I'm just going to knock her off and that'll make my career go, I just have to go just, just kill her. Um, Again, he did not, that's not great planning, and neither would be walking just walking there across the moors to to see if he can ca get Kathy to recognize him, and, and she didn't. So Heathcliff kills her, um, gets mad, gets mad. That's not very much planning either. Um, it's not a lot of planning. A lot of things happen after a crime. It's like, oh crap, I got to get rid of this stuff. <laughs> Whether they somebody said they saw somebody in a stream like washing up. Yes, person could go in there and just wash up their boots and everything so they don't have blood on them when they go home. Uh, when they get home, again, uh, you could take off your clothes in the yard. There's nobody around. You could just remove everything you're wearing in the yard and go walk in naked, get dressed, go back out in the yard and decide what to do with the crap. Set a fire. Wash the stuff up. Whatever you're, whatever it is you're going to do. Um, it's, it's, it's just there, there's so many ways that you can end up with no no uh evidence linking you to the crime it's unfortunate but um and then we're talking 1996 so who knows how well everything was done and what was available at the time um he's not going anyway he's staying with chickens he did have chickens in the movie but he's been booted out so he doesn't have his chickens anymore um uh let him win a free holiday to france and notify <laughs> gender arms he's on the way I think he'll never set foot in France. I think that that's a, we, we can be sure of that he's not going to go there because he could get arrested and get 25 years if he walks in there. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Sarah says, I got to bounce people. Have a good rest. Take care, Pat. See you soon, guys. Uh, <laughs> bye, Sarah. Um, so basically that's it. Um, if, it was all very, very fascinating. Um, and uh uh, yeah, we, we say he's never going to be arrested unless he goes to France, unless some bizarre thing ever happens. Um, will anybody else ever be arrested? If they found DNA that matched somebody else or somewhere down the line, I guess, uh, you know, he could say, ha, told you so. You know, it was that crazy, some crazy passer, you know, guy passing through that nobody even knew existed. Some, some hippie freak, you know, um, that's a kind of a hippie town. But, you know. Somebody just didn't have a place to go at Christmas, so they were just wandering around and and see, told you so. So he could be innocent. He could. I can't prove he did it. I can't prove he's guilty. And I think they made the right call not taking him to court. I just think they were a little harsh on the guards. I think that guards probably, in my opinion, a lot of times what happens in certain cases is the police actually do know they're pretty darn sure of what they know. They just can't find a way to prove it in a court of law. And I think that's why they were so hell bent on him. I think they really absolutely 100% thought it was him. And, um, and I'm sure they were very frustrated that it wasn't going to be taken to court, but that lack of physical, physical evidence did the case in. And uh, yeah, and even though he didn't have an alibi, and even though he did confess, and even though he burned things in New York, even though blah, blah, blah. I guess they felt it wasn't enough to, to say he's absolutely guilty. So, and he's, uh, 
living his life suing people. <laughs> but I'm glad Jules finally threw him out. I'm, I'm real curious about why she threw him out. I would be curious to see whether someday she'll change her story about what happened those many years ago. But I have a feeling that she's one of those people that will never, ever admit. If there was something more, I don't think she's ever going to admit it. Because that's what she does. She blocks things out. She said it. I would just block it out. All right, Jules. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, very, very. it was a fascinating case. Absolutely fascinating. So I'm um, glad you came for this. Uh, I missed a, I lost a few of my pictures along the way. There was just so much in this case. It was hard to condense into into this uh, into this particular video without being a person who edits and plans all this stuff out and you know puts 50 hours into putting it together. Um, it's tricky. And uh, there was there's just so much more. So I, I will link the book and the videos and then you can, if you want to explore this further and see whether you find any more reasons to believe in his innocence or his guilt, uh, you know, I have at it. Um, but that's my, those are my thoughts on the case. And um, what I think the two best motives are if he was guilty. And I, I would personally think the Heathcliff motive, um, <laughs> I call it the Heathcliff motive, was actually in the long run more believable than the uh, want to restart my uh, journalism career just because I don't know that he put that much effort out for the other one. So, oops, I got a sneeze. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> only four. Ah. <laughs> I like to end the show in an unusual way. Oh, gosh. Oh, anyway. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> so I, I will see you next round. I will see you during the, the week for the Hangout. And um, so thank, thanks for the recommendation for this, uh, this particular show. And I hope anybody in Ireland has forgiven me for my pronunciations. And uh, I'll be curious to see if you're, if, you're, if you're Irish and watching this or you're French and watching this uh, or even... In British and watching this, do do put stuff in the comments below about what you think about what I've said during the, the video and, and the theories and so and so forth. Be curious to see uh, where you come down on the whole thing. So anyway, bye bye everybody, and I will I will see you see you next round. Okay, 